Welcome to another edition of Football Fridays in Georgia here on Georgia Public Broadcasting. Tonight we're in Clarkston, Georgia. We're at Halford Stadium where a couple of region rivals were Clyde tonight. We've got the Panthers of Southwest DeKalb taking on the Jaguars of Stevenson. Our hearts go out to Decula High School where earlier today students were involved in a tragic accident. Their football game has been postponed until tomorrow. But tonight I'll bring you the story of a phenomenal young lady in that program, a kicker who's breaking the rules. I'm Larry Smith coming up for Extra Point segment, all the keys to tonight's game. And I'm Matt Stewart coming up in our College Football Hall of Fame recruiting roundup. We'll take a look at a star-studded Stevenson lineup has a chance to earn a state playoff berth tonight. So tonight, it's a region rivalry. We've got a big cat fight coming your way. It's the Jaguars taking on the Panthers. The All Access Pass pregame show kicks off next, live on GPB. You are looking live at Halford Stadium where tonight the host Southwest DeKalb Panthers take on the 7-1 Jaguars of Stevenson. The Panthers are 4-4 four four so far this season under head coach Michael Tanks. They've nabbed 16 region titles and two state championships. Coach Ron Gartrell has been at the helm of Stevenson Jaguars since their football program began in 1996. He's led the team to seven region titles and so far they are 7-1 so far this season. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to Football Fridays in Georgia here on Georgia Public Broadcasting. I'm Mark Harmon, and tonight we were prepared to bring you the Archer at Decula game. But due to a tragic accident involving a couple of Decula High School students, our plans have had to change. And so we're going to cover this one and instead, a huge DeKalb County rivalry. And I'm Jackie Britton, and of course, a lot of fans have had to comment or have commented on social media about the tragedy at Decula. So we wanted to give them a moment to talk about that online and have have that community speak out their feelings. So let's walk over here. We're going to talk a little social media. You can find us on all platforms at GPB Sports on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. But here's from the Decula community so far. Decula Senior says there will be a candlelight vigil memorial for Jared Brown tonight at the football stadium at 7 o'clock. So that's actually happening right now. And then Madison Mosley expressing her prayers going out to the community tonight for Skylar Bird, Parker Fenton, and Jared Brown. Hashtag one family, one Decula. And this comment is from Kobe Smith, who is actually a player for Archer High School, their opponent. He is expressing his condolences at well, as well, saying hashtag Decula strong. So don't forget, you can join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, all platforms. You can find us at GPB Sports. Now, while we're talking about Decula, I want to introduce you to a young woman who's doing phenomenal things over at Decula. She's a foot female, but she's shaking things up on the football field. Sabrina Seibel is just like any other senior at Tequila High School. She loves to go shopping and hang out with her friends, but... Oh, right, that. She's also the backup kicker on the varsity football team. I remember when I told my dad sophomore year I wanted to play football, he went to Target, bought a football, and was like, okay, we're going to kick this. Don't get it too dirty because when you realize it's harder than you think, we're going to return it. I was really surprised. I thought it would be harder. I mean, I tried at the same time that she did. I'm like, wow, I can barely get the ball in the air. I really know how people would react to what I'm doing, and it was something totally new. There's nobody's footsteps I could follow or... I just kind of had to make my own path. <laughs> a soccer player first, Sabrina is a living example of the saying, if you can dream it, you can do it, whether it's on the field or in her toughest class, AP Literature. She has all AP courses, and she does really well in all of them, but I think it's the first time that she's been challenged in this way. I think it's like everything else. She rises to that challenge. She's going to do it. But don't be fooled by the helmet and pads. She wasn't always this tough. You know, every time she fell down, she just look at us and then she'll go, Wah! and I'm like, oh my God, okay, it's time for her to get into soccer. We thought we got to do something because it was just drama if she ever tripped. And we're like, yeah, we just needed to get something to kind of toughen her up. Whether it's getting her nails done or being with friends, she's still girly at heart. She loves high heels, she loves dresses, she loves going to proms. When I interact with her, it's about sports and school. She's never met a challenge she didn't love, and her family thinks it's good. She's very driven, and I think that's something that's going to serve her well in life, is that she just doesn't want to be blending in. She wants to stand out in everything she does. 
Sabrina Seibel, a phenomenal young woman, and she was friends with the two men who were involved in that car accident earlier today. So she tweeted out earlier saying, we've been playing soccer together since we were in second grade. So hearts certainly broken for the Decula community tonight. Thank you, Jackie. Tonight's game is a great matchup between the Stevenson Jaguars and the Panthers of Southwest DeKalb. Both are heralded programs, both have outstanding coaches, and both sidelines are loaded with talented players. Let's check in now with our play-by-play -play team of Matt Stewart and Larry Smith. Time for a little X's and O's, a little chalk talk, a segment we call Extra Point. All right, thanks, uh, Larry. Good to see you again. Let's see if we can't get this uh, extra point through the upright. And let's start with Southwest DeKalb. On offense, they want to fling it. Yeah, they really do. A young man named Justin Tomlin, only a sophomore, but already his number one ranked uh, passer in, uh, in the, all of DeKalb County. He is one of the top young passers in the state and certainly somebody they're going to look to. And the Panthers have the number one total offensive team in the county as well, just under 400 yards per game. Now, on defense, they want to break Stevenson's wing tee offense. Yeah, Stevenson, again, this is just, that's their bread and butter. Uh, almost 2,000 yards rushing uh, already on the season. you got to stop that if you want a chance to win this game. High discipline, being disciplined in your run fits, very important exactly. if you want to stop the wing tee. All right, for the Stevenson Jaguars on offense, they want to run downhill. Yeah, same same thing again. 240 yards per game, it's, it's what they do. Again, pick your spots, wear down the defense, get some big gains. If they can do that, they got a great chance of winning this game. But they will be without their leading rusher, Jalen Marson Knight tonight. He uh, hyperextended his elbow last week and he's rushed for nearly 900 yards so they got to find a replacement for him on defense the Jaguars want to go get the quarterback yeah young man named Aaron Sterling he is a stud we're gonna call his name a lot tonight already 16 quarterback sacks 25 tackles for loss you will know where he is on the field at all times 33 total quarterback sacks for this Jaguars aggressive defense and 88 tackles for loss wow that's a look at your extra point Thanks, guys. Participating in athletics can help children adopt healthy, lifelong habits. And joining me now to discuss how sports can help kids is Dr. Robert Hamilton of Cigna. And Dr. Hamilton, what do sports teach young adults about life? Well, sports are a great opportunity to learn life lessons. The uh, accountability to teammates, the ability to work as a team for a common goal, it's going to serve you well later in life. It also teaches you about winning and losing, which everyone's going to have a little bit in life. You learn how to deal with adversity when you lose, and you learn how to celebrate celebrate winning together when you win. So it helps them stay well-rounded. I like that. You bet. Athletes have also very busy schedules. How does that impact their futures? Yeah, the discipline that you get in uh, sports helps you stay organized. It forces you to stick to a schedule, which includes study habits that many times are overlooked. People think student athletes are totally focused on the sports, but they actually have a disciplined life that lends themselves to better accomplishments in academics many times than the general student body. And I mean, it would seem that athletes are more prone to help your lifestyle. Is sure, that right? absolutely. The things they learn in terms of practice and discipline in that area as well, they take that into their future lives. The ability to uh, exercise regularly, to eat properly, nutritional aspects really sets them up for a good, healthy life. And unfortunately, lastly, got to go easy on the Halloween candy. Is that what you're going to tell me next? Are you speaking to me personally <laughs> about that? Yes. <laughs> I'll do my best. That's okay. all I can say. Dr. Hamilton, thank you very much for joining us for this signature moment. Thank you. All right, we're getting ready for this big game between the Jaguars and the Panthers. Time now to check in with John Nelson, who is always getting ready for Halloween. And like Linus waits in the pumpkin patch for the great pumpkin, he's going to talk to the uh, head coach of the Stevenson Jaguars, the only head coach Stevenson has ever had, Mr. Ron Gartrell. John? And, and we're going to kind of break the fourth wall here a little bit. He's talking with the officials, so we'll see if we can duck in here to a little bit of this conversation. And what they're doing right now is they're going over game balls, making sure that everyone's got the game balls and everything that they need to make sure that the game is going to be what the game is going to be. You've got your handshakes, and here he is. Here's the head coach of the Stevenson Jaguars. For those who've never seen this rivalry, can you kind of break it down for everybody? Well, you know, uh, I've been in every game that we've played, and uh, I think it's the, uh, the schools are so much similarity in the schools in terms of the athletes and the coaches and the way we go about uh, doing things and you know it just turned into a uh, I don't call any of them rivalries but it's, it's turned into a very competitive series and uh, 
You know, I think they won half and we won half. Uh, you know, I love Buck Godfrey to death, and uh, I'm kind of glad he's gone, but and I hope he's enjoying his retirement. But, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we just try to prepare, and I know they do the same thing over there. So, and, and I know that in a competitive series like this, in this particular version, you're going up against a real prolific offense, and that's got to be the number one thought in your mind. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. You know, that's our biggest concern. You know, the speed they have, and they got a, a very good quarterback over there. They protect them pretty good. So, you know, our work is cut out for us defensively. But we hope we can, um, you know, use a little bit of clock and control the, the ball a little bit more than you know, we did last week. All right. We will see you out there in the field. Thanks for hanging out with us for a little bit. That is the head coach of the Stevenson Jaguars, Ron Gartrell. We will see him out here on the field in just a few minutes when the game and the clock start. Let's send it back over to Mark and Jackie. All right, John, thank you very much. We want to thank the superintendent of DeKalb County Schools, Dr. R. Stephen Green, and athletic director Horace Dunson, and administrator Jackie Simmons for helping us get this game on the air tonight. We thank you very much. GPB Sports thanks you very much. And football fans around the great state of Georgia, thank you very much for helping us bring this broadcast your way. Now, we're just getting warmed up on the all-access pass. Matt Stewart's going to drop by and talk a little recruiting. Also, we'll see what fans are saying online in the social media world. It's going to be a senior night here tonight on the field so certainly a lot of things to look forward to a big time check presentation coming up later but that's just the beginning of what we have in store on this football fridays in georgia all access pass stay with us football fridays in georgia on gpb is made possible in part by regions bank it's time to expect more Georgia's Electric Membership Corporation, lighting the way. Technical College System of Georgia, learn more, earn more. Cigna, together all the way. And viewers like you, thank you. You exercise, you choose the salad, occasionally. But staying well, physically, financially, emotionally, is hard on your own. So Cigna's got your back and your knees 24-7. Cigna's there to answer your questions. Or when you need some coaching. In sickness and in health, Cigna's there, helping you to get well and stay well. That's having a partner who's with you all the way. Cigna. Stay connected to your team like never before with the GPB Sports Football app. Get the latest news. Watch featured games live wherever you Sammy are. Williams, find the hole. Look at that. Look at that. Find relevant info on schools and take interactive 3D tours of stadiums around the state. Tweet game highlights from the stands and get up to the minute scores all Friday night. The gridiron has gone digital. Download the free GPB Sports Football app from the iTunes App Store now. Welcome back to the GPB All Access Pass pregame show. We are live at Halford Stadium, where the big DeKalb rivalry is about to kick off between Stevenson and Southwest DeKalb. And we want to let everybody know that tomorrow at 7.30, DeCula will play Archer in that game that was scheduled for tonight and that was postponed. So that'll be tomorrow night at 7.30. We welcome in now our play-by-play -play man, Matt Stewart, to talk a little recruiting on our College Football Hall of Fame recruiting roundup. And Matt, right off the top, we're going to start with Stevenson, and they've got a big defensive tackle, Aaron Sterling, who is outstanding. They have an outstanding defensive line, and this is going to be a big concern for Southwest to cab tonight, but you're talking about Aaron Sterling, who is a 24-7 sports composite, three-star defensive end for the class of 2017, the number 21 ranked strong side defensive end for the country among the junior class. He's got offers from South Carolina, North Carolina, Wake Forest, and California. He has 16 sacks already this season and 25 tackles for loss. Now there's another guy on that defensive line, a defensive end, Michael Pitts, and he's also a good one. That's right. So if you block, uh, if, you, if you're able to yeah, block Aaron Sterling, you got to worry about Michael Pitts, who's committed to Cincinnati. He's a 
defensive end. He has eight quarterback sacks, and he has 20 tackles for loss. And if you're able to block both those guys, you got to worry about the other defensive end, Dennis Wanham, who is committed to Iowa State. So you have three D1 prospects, legitimate D1 big-time college football prospects on that defensive line. It's a big reason why the Jaguars have 33 quarterback sacks and 88 tackles for loss this season. And if for some reason you get past the defensive right. line, they've got a guy <laughs> playing in the defensive secondary who's outstanding as well. Well, Southwest DeKalb has the number one passing offense in DeKalb County, led by Justin Tomlin. But uh, if he's able to avoid the pass rush, if they can keep him clean tonight, you got to be careful when you throw the ball downfield because Stevenson has one of the top-ranked safeties in the country as well in the class of 2017. And we're talking about Carlito Gonzalez, 24-7 sports composite, three-star, number 26 safety in the country. He is committed to the Auburn Tigers. All right. Nobody knows recruiting like our Matt Stewart on our College Football Hall of Fame recruiting roundup. And these days, you don't have to just watch football on the TV screen. You can watch it on our app. That's right. If you go to the App Store, you can type in GPB Sports and download it for free. You can keep up with scores from around the state of Georgia, other football games, but also stream this one live from your mobile device. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. And I have a question for everyone at home tonight. What's the worst Halloween candy you've ever gotten? For me, it was floss. I mean, really? I really went to the wrong house on that one. So we asked the question to some of you folks on social media and our own John Nelson quick to respond. He says candy from Europe that I couldn't pronounce that tasted like cardboard. That sounds like a very John Nelson thing to say. And then we have another tweet from Too Big to Fail. It says, I had a neighbor from the Middle East. She invited my brother and I in for flan, but it wasn't bad. OK, that's a really unique one. I like that. And then Patrick Mich Mitchell says, toothpaste, hands down the worst possible. I can relate to you on that one. Definitely going to the wrong houses. we got to figure that one out. So interact with us. Tell us about your worst Halloween candy that you've ever gotten or anything else. Show us some flashback Friday photos. Share anything that you want with us on Facebook, Twitter, at GPB Sports, and uh, we'll interact with you all night long, and maybe some of your pictures and photos and tweets will end up on the air. Mark. I got some really bad peanut brittle one time, and it was awful, I tell you. But I got something good to talk about now. John Nelson is standing alongside Cygnus Lorna Cunningham for a very big check presentation. John? Thank you very much, Mark. It is that time hanging out here with Lauren Cunningham from Cigna. Michael Tanks, the head coach of Southwest DeKalb. And Lauren, once again, thanks for being a part of our Football Fridays. Absolutely. We're happy to be here and support. All right, Coach, once again, thanks for letting us be a part. Uh, obviously, a, a rough night here in, in the city with other things going on, a very heavy hearts out in Gwinnett County, but thanks for letting us be a part of this big series that Coach Gartrell refers to it, not necessarily a rivalry. Yeah, we want to also uh, send our condolences out to the Kula High School. Um, but on behalf of our principal, Dr. Glanton, you know, we accept this check. And not only that, we want to thank uh, Signal not just for what you're doing for Southwest DeKalb, but what you're doing for all of high school sports. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Michael. Nothing like a Florida State guy saying some great words. Of course, I'm a Florida State guy, so I can say that. Mark, let's send it back over to you and Jackie. All right. Thank you very much, John. You know, the Atlanta Falcons are off to a great start. So let's go into the Falcons locker room with the team's top draft pick, a guy who played college football at Clemson and high school by ball at Adairsville High right here in Georgia. Linebacker Vic Beasley told Mark earlier about playing underneath those Friday night lights earlier this week. Look at you land in the big interview. That's right. <laughs> Always. This is a great feeling, man. Being able to go out there with the people that I've actually had the chance to grow up with my whole entire life. It was just a great feeling. Was there a, one particular game, one particular play that sticks out most in your memory? I mean, our quarterback, we had a great a great quarterback, Tyree Brown, my senior year, and he just was able to make amazing plays, and I just enjoy watching him most of the time. And I thought you might say one time you ran a kickoff back attempt and you ran it back for a touchdown. Yeah, I had a couple of those, but I think the exciting show was just watching him running around a lot. As a member of the Atlanta Falcons, what advice would you give to Georgia high school football players? Uh, just continue to work hard and just remember that uh, you're, an athlete, you're a student before you're an athlete. So I always focus on academics before you focus on being a great player. 
Man, that's terrific advice to all high school football players everywhere. You're a student first, you're an athlete second. Well, Michael Tanks is in his third season as the head coach of the Panthers of Southwest DeKalb. Last season he went 6-4. and four. This year he's 4-4. Four and four. He's doing an outstanding job there. And moments ago I talked to him about this year's team and how they are playing and about tonight's big matchup. Uh, we're a young team. Uh, we have about, I believe we have nine 10th graders actually starting on the varsity. Um, but we're excited about these young men, and they've been playing some pretty good football for us. Talk about tonight's matchup. You're going up against a very good 7-1 and one, uh, Jaguar team. Yeah, Stevenson and Ron Gottrell and his crew over there do a great job every year of making sure that they have a great football team and they're competing uh, in the state every year. So uh, we got our hands full tonight, but we're looking forward to the challenge. There's a lot on the line tonight because the winner of this game is going to take on Mays next week for the region championship. <laughs> yeah, and we kind of told our kids, you know, uh, this will give us an opportunity to play Mays again. Um, you know, uh, they, they kind of jumped on us in the uh, fourth quarter uh, of our ball game that we played them early in the year. So, um, you know, we're excited about them, but we got to take care of business first, which is Stevenson, and that's a handful in itself. To take care of business, what's one key thing you have to do tonight? Uh, control their defensive line. They have a very strong defensive line. They have one every year, but this year in particular, um, they have a very strong defensive line, and um, we're going to have to we're going to find a way to, to to control those guys. Coach, thanks for coming on with us. Good luck tonight. All right, appreciate it. And of course, next week we will have Mays and the winner of this uh, tights game at Lakewood Stadium at 7:30. It's getting closer and closer to playoff season. Before <laughs> you know it, we'll be at the championship games in the Georgia Dome. It's almost here. It's hard to believe it, that we're this far along already. I know. <laughs> it's still nice weather outside. Well, coming up on the All Access Pass pregame show, John Nelson is back for another edition of John's Georgia. Also, we'll hear what fans are saying online in the social media world. That and much more as we continue our coverage right here on GPB's pregame All access pass stay with us don't go anywhere the school I wasn't very interested in what was going on in the classroom I even considered dropping out did you know that high school dropouts commit about 75 percent of crime and they make a quarter of a million dollars less than graduates in the lifetime if you're struggling find someone to talk to that's what I did and I graduated high school. And that is a decision that I will never regret. Outdoors are back to back. A little something Our for everybody. Fantastic natural history, and it starts and ends on a Georgia beach. Oh, yeah. Catch all the fun, action, and beauty now on Thursday nights. Georgia Traveler at 8. And Georgia Outdoors at 8.30. Thursdays on GPB. Next time on The Guilty. I'm so sorry. Local police have confirmed that the body found is Callum Reed. You need up with no pair. She was still the last person to see Callum alive. Someone came into the house and they took him. Daniel Reed and his wife Claire got into a little spat. So it must be one of us. The question is, where were you? We were going to find him and bring him home. You lied to the people who were trying to find your son. Sunday at 10 on GPB. Game day brings out the best in all of us. At Regions, every day is game day. When I was in school, I wasn't very interested in what was going on in the classroom. I even considered dropping out. Did you know that high school dropouts commit about 75% of 
of crime, and they make a quarter of a million dollars less than graduates in the lifetime. If you're struggling, find someone to talk to. That's what I did. And I graduated high school. And that is a decision that I will never regret. And the national anthem has just been played here at Hallford Stadium. Welcome back to the GPB All Access Pass pregame show. We're getting ready for Southwest DeKalb taking on Stevenson. And as we were saying earlier, it's hard to believe there's only two games left of the regular season. And then it's the five-week drive to survive on the road to the Georgia Dome and the state championship game. And GPB will have you covered all the way through. Now let's talk about what you guys are talking about online in the social media world. Here's what's trending. Now I have a story that's going to really tug at your heartstrings. And if it doesn't, you need to get your heart checked, okay? This is Tario Lavelle Fuller. He's a 19-year-old freshman football player at Purdue University. He is from Gwinnett, and he was at Target in Indiana a few weeks ago, and he took note of a young girl and her mom looking at dolls for her third birthday, and he asked her which one was her favorite. He took it, he bought it, and he returned it to her in the aisle with a receipt. Just a random act of kindness. We thought that was absolutely awesome. This photo went viral on Facebook, on Twitter, and uh, just a remarkable thing. And then we saw that Purdue Athletics tweeted out saying, we couldn't be more proud of the type of young men and women in our athletics department. Hashtag boiler up. And also, guys, our own John Nelson here. The last time we were at Halford Stadium, he is trying his hardest to command the band here. And we want you to caption this photo because we just really need help here. The best caption, tweet us at GPB Sports, hashtag caption this. The best thing will come up here on the air and we'll send you a prize because this is absolutely remarkable. John Nelson had no idea what he was getting into when he did this, or maybe he did, Pro probably a little bit of both. But tweet us on Facebook, Twitter. Also, don't forget you can download our app it's free. Go to the App Store, type in GPB Sports. You can keep up with scores from around the state of Georgia. You can also stream this game live from another mobile device, so be sure to do that. But definitely, no matter what you do, be sure to caption this video. John Nelson, sorry. No, you're not. <laughs> no, I'm not. You're right. You are uh, no way. I think my caption would be the man climbing the ladder to success. Hashtag caption this and oh. run away quickly. All right. Well, we've got John in here for another edition of John's Georgia brought to you by Georgia EMC. All right. Topic number one, a bit of a surprise coming out of Columbus, Georgia. And for this, we're going to spend some time in Diverse Power and Flint Energies to let you in on a very important game tonight and what happened last week to set up this big game tonight down in Columbus. And it has to do with the Patriots of Northside taking on Columbus High School. Two surprises so far this season. Northside would eventually win this game, Mark, 24-17, and it sets up tonight's game with Northside and Carver. The winner wins Region 1-5A and gets a lot of home games to start the playoffs. That's it for topic number one. What's topic number two? Topic number two is the Monroe Tornadoes pulling off the upset. They did. Most certainly we're going to spend some time in Grady and Mitchell EMC for this one and show you how the tough times for the Cairo syrup makers continue. Take you back to last week and Cairo had some issues grabbing the football in the end zone. So as a result, Monroe out of Doherty County and Albany, as they say, would improve to five and three as Richard Robinson would hit a field goal for the win, 16-14, and that sets Region 1, Subregion A, into a bit of a tizzy right now. Monroe, 5-3, and three, Cairo, 3-4, three and four going into tonight's action. That's it for topic two. What's topic number three? Well, topic number three is we hate to be in a tizzy at any time, but... Unless, Benedict of course, Jackie Britton shows a photo and it's hashtag caption this. Yes, but Benedictine won last year, and they're on that same path this year. How many teams are undefeated in AA? That's your trivia question early on. Mm, four. Close. Three. And one of them is Benedictine. And the Cadets are run by head coach Danny Britt. They are 8-0. They are running the table again, trying to repeat as champs. We caught up with him to find out how his approach is a little different when it comes to preparing his kids for a repeat. 
we set our goals with our seniors uh, having nothing to do with winning championships or X number of games, and, and that's what we've done every year. Uh, so we focus in on each day and making that day the best it can be, whatever we're doing, whether it's just meeting or, or, or working out or practicing or playing a game. You know, we, we try to focus in on that and, and keep them focused in on those smaller goals and, and let the big goals take care of themselves. And we spent some time in Kanuchi EMC for that. And I'm guessing this is Chewbarca. This is Chewbarca. This is our mascot. He'll be Leo. the warmest one here this evening. I will guarantee you that. <laughs> and you know what? He has been named the Wookiee of the Year. Oh, no. <laughs> How about that? No, no, no. You no, got to no. like that. You know, he has another uh, costume that he wears sometimes. He's yeah. a great Dane. <laughs> And you're so funny. I'm going really to take, take my headset off and wander to the I sidelines. I, I love Halloween. Now, back to business. Wow, Just, how incredibly punny that last <laughs> segment was. Back to business real quick. There's yeah. a big game down in Wintersville, Georgia, and you're going to be covering that going all around the state. Tell us how you're going to do that. Tonight. The kick in it segment tonight will have a lot of action. Swamp War down in Region 2, Single A is going on. You've also got the Wintersville Classic with Lowndes and Valdosta, huge stuff. We will let you know what's going on around the state as we are only that many weeks away from the playoffs. All right, are you ready for some football? I'm ready, it's that time. We're counting down to kickoff. Listen, we got Lions and, and Tigers just, and Bears oh and Chewbacca's. I get and to escape. plenty of awful puns to come later in the League show, League leader I'm right sure. there, there's your MV punter uh, right there. All right, we got the Jaguars of Stevenson. Yes. Against the Panthers of I'm Southwest I'm still waiting for puns. It is where's, where's game my last time pun? on Football Fridays in Georgia, live, live on, on GPB. GPB. It's the eve of All Hallows' Eve, and our minds have turned to the fiendish and diabolical. Who embodies that mood more than fabled and famously troubled American writer Edgar Allan Poe? His tales of mystery and imagination have haunted generations since Poe first put pen to paper. Did you know that a man from Washington, Georgia had his own dark dealings with the Gothic bard? Thomas Hawley Chivers, though he had a medical degree, preferred to write poetry and plays. He was obsessed with death and the afterlife, and somehow his early work attracted the attention of Edgar Allan Poe. Amazingly, the two became pen pals. Chivers even offered lifetime financial support for Poe if he moved from New York to the South. But it was not to be. Although Chivers visited the ailing writer in 1845, Poe's issues with demon alcohol drove a wedge between them. After Poe died in 1849, Chivers accused him of plagiarism, even claiming Poe's most famous poem, The Raven, had been taken from Chivers' own work. A bold claim. We're only two weeks away from the start of the playoff rounds. Who's in it to win it tonight? Football Fridays in Georgia starts right now. Welcome to James Halford Stadium in Clarkston for another Football Friday in Georgia. Tonight, the fifth-ranked Stevenson Jaguars take on the Southwest DeKalb Panthers with a spot in the state playoffs hanging in the balance for the winners. And here's a look at the Region 6 5A Division A standings. You'll see the importance of tonight's ball game. Stevenson riding the crest of a six-game winning streak 4-0 in the region. Southwest DeKalb has won two straight in three of their last four. They are 3-1. The winner of tonight's ball game will play the winner of Division B, and that's Mays next Friday night for the region championship. And good evening. I'm Matt Stewart, joined by Larry Smith, and happy Halloween Eve, and 13th <laughs> all-time meeting between these two DeKalb County rivals, and it's a big one. 
Yeah, it really is. And it's it's funny that, you know, that obviously the names change, the players change in high school football. But it's one of the great rivalries in DeKalb County. And as you mentioned, so much at stake. It's kind of what you expect when you see these two teams come together, that they've got something to play for. I mean, high, high stakes tonight on this Friday night. And also, if you win tonight's ball game, you're guaranteed a first-round playoff game in the state playoffs that begin in two weeks. Let's start with this Southwest DeKalb team. They have the number one offense in DeKalb County, averaging just under 400 yards of total offense per game and led by their sophomore quarterback, Justin Tomlin. Yeah, he is outstanding. I mean, think about it. High school football, 400 yards per game. I guess just a sophomore, one of the top young quarterbacks in the state. Uh, he's already the top passer in the Cab County, and he's somebody we'll be watching to uh, to do a lot of things tonight for Southwest DeKalb. He's thrown for 1,717 yards in their first eight games, 11 touchdowns, and just four interceptions. Now he's going up against a Stevenson defense that really loves to get after the quarterback. Yeah, they really do. I mean, they've got, what, I think 33 quarterback sacks, 17 of them by their star defensive uh, lineman, uh, Aaron Sterling. He is just outstanding. We're going to call his number all night long. 16 sacks, 25 tackles for loss. I mean, he is, you know, we, every week we see there's that one defensive beast that we watch. He's the guy tonight on defense. And Sterling's just a junior. He's got offers from South Carolina, North Carolina, Wake Forest, and California. And he's one of just three division one prospects on that defensive line. He's got uh, Michael Pitts, who lines up next to him. He's committed to Cincinnati. And he's got Dennis Wanham over on the other side. And Wanham is committed to Iowa State. Now, the third member of our team committed to GPB <laughs> is John Nelson. And yeah, graduate of Lakeside DeKalb and Florida State University. The one thing that Michael Tanks and I have in common, he was far better athlete than I. Thanks for accessing us however you are doing so, whether it's on GPB TV, GPB.org, or the GPB sports app when you're looking at Stevenson and what Ron Gartrell has built since day one coming from Shamrock and working his way over to create the program at Stevenson this particular season there's one thing that stands out they have not lost to a team inside the state of Georgia the one blemish on their record came against American Heritage on this very field in the Battle of the Borders. Ever since then, they have hit full song, and they're hitting full song at the right time. And Matt, you and Larry have talked about the region substandings and how things will go one way or the other. For Southwest DeKalb, this is a game that pretty much they're going to need to try to get a matchup to be a one or a two seat coming into the playoffs. So if they lose tonight, it's going to be a taller road going up against perhaps a Creekside or going against a Carver Atlanta in that crossover game for game 10 when it comes to the last game and figuring out whether or not you're going to be in the playoffs or where you're going to be. We will have election coverage all night long. Let you know what's going on around the state. Kicking it. Region one's back in play. Let you know what's going on. Let's light a Halloween candle. Matt and Larry back upstairs. I think that would be a jack-o'-lantern. So let's, <laughs> write, let's light a jack-o'-lantern for tonight's That's ballgame. Right. They're Southwest to Cab, four and four on the season. As I mentioned, they've won two straight, three of uh, four since starting the season, one and three. So they have rebounded nicely from a poor start coming off a 41-7 win against Druid Hills last Friday night. And uh, he mentioned, Nellie mentioned that crossover game last year. They lost their crossover game to Carver Atlanta in that uh, Region 6 playoff. Stevenson, on the other hand, you're right. They're undefeated in the state of Georgia. 7-1, 4-0 in the division. 27-13 win against MLK last uh, Friday night, and man, they have been on a roll since that loss to American Heritage, a team ranked number 21 in the USA Today Super 25. They have outscored their opponents 256 to 25, Larry, during that six game winning streak with four shutouts. Wow, that's again the defense we're talking about, as we said before, uh, I think 88 tackles for loss on the season. I mean, they have just got an outstanding defense, and that's the thing, that's why they're so excited about uh, what's uh, to come. Uh, for the Jaguars in the future, in the November, and they can get deep into November. It's that defense uh, that's just outstanding. And it's got to concern Southwest to Cab. You look at, at really the Panthers right now, as you talked about, they're peaking at the right time in terms of struggling early. They've right of the ship. But tonight, what a litmus test for them, again, with a uh, chance to play Mays next week on the line. Well, Stevenson leads the all-time series as they crash the banner and enter Halford Stadium. But lead the series only 6-5. They've won four straight in the series, series dating back to 1998. They've won six of the last eight in the series after losing the first three. 25-7 winners a year ago, and they have outscored Southwest DeKalb 98-14 in the last four meetings between these two teams. So Stevenson 
comes in as the heavy favorite tonight against the Southwest DeKalb team trying to crash the party and earn a spot against Mays in the region championship game next Friday night. And as John was talking about, this is a much bigger deal for Southwest DeKalb than it is for Stevenson. As you mentioned, if Stevenson should lose, they're still going to get into the playoffs. They'll still have a, have a shot there and to get a chance at a, a home field game coming up here in a couple of weeks. For Southwest DeKalb, that's not the case. If they lose tonight, uh, they fall into a tiebreak situation where they're going to need some help, get a win next week and some help to try to find the way into the playoffs. So really, this is, is their Super Bowl. This is their game that they really have to win this tonight. Um, and other, otherwise, they fall into a totally different situation than, than Stevenson would. Well, there's head coach Michael Tanks in his third season as the Panthers head coach since replacing the legendary Buck Godfrey. And Tanks is 12-16 and 16 with the Panthers, 40-58 and 58 overall in his 10 seasons as a head coach, which includes two seasons with Decatur and five seasons where he began his career at Tri-Cities. And there, legendary in his own right, is Ron Gartrell in his 20th season. 20th season at Stevenson, 168 and 61 is record, 28th season overall. And Gartrell just recently passed by the 200 win plateau. He's now at 202 and 107, which includes his 34 and 46 record in eight seasons at Shamrock High School. That's impressive. 200 wins. I don't care what level you're on. That's just that's just amazing. So just about set to get this one started. Calvin Scott with the kickoff going to be taken by Khalil Newton at the 15 yard line. And Khalil Newton scoots to the outside. And Newton finally brought down at the 50-yard line. And that's great field position for the Stevenson Jaguars team to begin the offense tonight. There is a flag down on the field. Yeah, I thought there might have been a hold in there. It's been some, otherwise in pretty good blocking. Let's see if this comes back. Usually it's against the receiving team. Let's see what the call is. Uh, maybe not. No, it picked up the flag. No, there's no flag at all. So, okay, we're going to keep it here. Midfield. In that end, there was some great blocking uh, on that return. Over 30 yards on the return to get it to midfield. What a great starting point now for Stevenson as they uh, get the ball first here, the first series uh, on offense. So Stevenson will start at the 50-yard line. Hand off right up the middle. And a cut to the outside. And Antonio Woods finally brought down at the eight-yard line. Touchdown saving tackle by Jonathan Green. Well, what a move for this. And remember, Stevenson, we talked about on the pregame, they're without Jalen Marson, neither leading rusher. No problem. You just go to the next guy, Antonio Woods, the 5'9 running back. Look at these great moves right here. Almost gets it to Painter. What a great start right here now for the Jaguars. Again, without your top rusher, but as we talked about, Matt, in the open, this wing T offense, they just they love just to punch it down your throat. 240 yards rushing per game, and they showed you right there. That's a big chunk of yards. 43 yards right there in the first play of scrimmage. And so let's see, we have a timeout called, I believe. We have a sideline warning given to Stevenson. It was the direction in which they pointed. Yeah, sideline warning against Stevenson. So the next one will be a penalty. So first and goal to go for Stevenson from the seven yard line after a 43 yard run by Antonio Woods on the first snap of the ball game. Again, replacing the 892 yard rusher Jalen Marson Knight tonight, who hyperextended his elbow in last week's victory over ML King. Desert Cook on the carry and Cook down to about the four yard line. Running back by committee. You know, I go back to that Woods run there off the, the first play from scrimmage from midfield. There wasn't a blue shirt that touched him for the first 30 yards. I mean, he that hole was gaping that he ran through. I could have run through that and actually gotten some positive yards. That's how big that hole was because I'm very slow. <laughs> Second down and goal from the four-yard line for the Stevenson Jaguars, 7-1 and one on the season. And a very impressive start for Stevenson. And jumping off sides down here on the near edge was Eric Elder, the split end. So a five yard mark off coming up against the Jaguars. Stevenson right now seems a little bit 
uh, kind of out of rhythm a little bit here. We had the sideline warning after the first play. Ward and Sink on the, the high count right there. Early game jitters, even though they off to that great start with that big run by Woods. And the nice return to start the game on the opening kickoff. So second down and goal now coming from the nine yard line. And another whistle. And so a choppy there. start for this yeah. ball game as the Jaguars call a timeout. Yeah, once again, uh, as I, like I said before, it's like they're not they're not quite in sync. Let's go back to that first play again. The big return gets it to midfield. Uh, that was nice. And then this is Woods. Watch this right here. Yeah, I don't see any blue shirts touch him. Still hasn't. Right there. He he ran <laughs> uh, 40 yards without a blue shirt touching him until finally the, the uh, touchdown saving tackle. Antonio Woods, the transfer from South Gwinnett High School, who did not play last year because of a knee injury. Getting his opportunity tonight because of the injury in the backfield. That'll be very important for the Stevenson team and their future going forward in the playoffs if they make the playoffs. Uh, to have Jalen Marson Knight, who put on a monster show in our GPB game and their 49 to 12 victory over Creekside back in September. Good looking running back. As you mentioned, hyper extended elbow, so sitting this one out. Let's see if uh, Stevenson can get on the same page here. There's their quarterback, Xavier Shepard, the 5'11, 175 pound junior. Hand off Antonio Woods, and Woods finds no running room that time as he's tackled by Chris, or make part, pardon me, Eris Walker, and it's going to be third down and goal. When we look at it here, they did a nice job, the defense just sealing up the hole. Nice job right there, as you mentioned, uh, by number 25, is that Walker? Eris Walker making the tackle, and it's going to be third down and goal from the six. Now, neither one of these teams had great field goal kickers. Darian Tisdale, the kicker for the Jaguars, is just a freshman. And another whistle. Timeout now by Southwest to camp. Gonna be out of timeouts here before the first quarter's over. <laughs> so both teams have burned a timeout here in the first two minutes and 13 seconds of this game. Yeah, Southwest to camp. I'm not sure if it was personnel or just the alignment. They're going to make a couple of shifts here, it looks like. In terms of personnel. <laughs> Let's check in with John Nelson down on the sideline. As it is two weeks, including tonight, that we are almost to the playoffs, we will have what we are referring to almost jokingly as election coverage. We'll be ducking into games in and around the state with our friends at ESE Networks with Wintersville Classic kicking off at 8 o'clock and the NFHS Network, which games have started at 7, some at 7.30. And there you go, kicking it right there. That's what we're going to be doing around the state all night. And there's Pius and Stone Mountain. St. Pius, with a win this evening, can be the first team in Quad A to clinch a region title and be a one seed and get a lot of home games at Maloof Stadium for the first couple of rounds. You see they're already 14 up on the Pirates of Stone Mountain. That's our first round of kicking it. We'll have more as we go. Real quick before we get to, uh, back to play here, Math Reason, Southwest DeKalb called a timeout. They had 12 men on the field. It's good if you can get away with it. Yeah, that's right. So third down and goal from the six yard line. Shepard wants to throw. He's been given plenty of time. Flag out, throws to the back of the end zone. And we probably have a holding call coming up here against Stevenson. That's what it is. So. Remember what I said a few moments ago, Stevenson does not have a very experienced kicker. And so you back this up 10 yards, and now if you fail on third down, you're looking at a 30-plus field goal. I don't know that they can convert that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And now on the other side for Southwest DeKalb, a chance to gain some momentum. Uh, you have the two big bang-bang plays to start the game with a nice kickoff return in the midfield. The big 43 run by Woods gets, gets down to the seven. Now all of a sudden it's third and goal. From out here at the 16, if you can get a couple of stops here, your defense stops their offense with no points. What great momentum would you turn over to, to your offense? And Larry, I believe that Stevenson's in four down territory yeah. right here from their 16 yard line. Unless they can get the ball inside the five yard line at that point where you're talking about maybe, well, let's see what they're going to do here. Another, another penalty? 
Well, they never marked off the holding call. Oh, well, they, they declined the penalty. Oh, to make it fourth down. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to be fourth down and goal from the seven. We never got a signal from the officials that they had declined the penalty. So yeah. now they'll bring the field goal unit on, I believe. Interesting move. Like you said, not a strong kicker. Yeah, Darian Tisdale, the 5'8", 160-pound freshman, will attempt a 24-yard field goal from the middle of the field. And the kick is going to be no good. He pushed it off to the left. And so the decision by Michael Tanks to decline the penalty works for the Panthers, and the Jaguars come up empty on their first possession. Yeah, what a what a great momentum shift again for Southwest to have. You, you stop him, you had it one play from scrimmage, your, your backs are against the wall, first and goal from the seven, and to make a stop and come in with no points, that, that's, a, that's a big, big confidence boost uh, for your defense. So the ball comes out to the 20-yard line for Southwest DeKalb and their first possession of the night. And there's their quarterback, number 17, Justin Tomlin, the 6'1 sophomore. You see his numbers. He's completed 72% of his passes for 1,717 yards, 11 touchdowns, and four interceptions. That makes him the number one passer in DeKalb County. Oh. First play of the game, handoff coming this way, and a big lick at the 23-yard line on the carry by Jordan Eastling. And Eastling picks up three yards on the play. If you got a chance to see that snap, that was almost a fumble. Watch this very closely. <laughs> it's a bad snap, and he just accidentally, he's going to try to catch it, the snap, and hand it off, and it going right into his hands, almost like a direct snap inadvertently. Yeah, that was a great job by Tomlin just to control the snap and number two, get the handoff off. <laughs> That's right. So second down and seven. Eastling gets the ball again and nothing doing for Eastling as he gets smothered by that defensive line. That was actually the linebacker, Amari Andrews, making the tackle for the Jaguars. And it's going to be third down. Big play right here. You can see uh, Tomlin running to the sideline, talking to the coaches, and running back out to the huddle to call the play in for third down. Let's see if we see Tomlin go to the air for the first time tonight. Another bad snap. Tomlin throwing off his back foot and throws a completion at the 32 yard line. And a flag down as well on the hit. You get Eugene Brown, I think, for, for targeting a helmet on helmet. Eric Johnson made the grab, and Johnson's still down after picking up the first down. And attacking the 15 yards on top of this. What a great job, though, by Tomlin to corral that errant snap. The center's got to get the ball back there better. Great athletics is athleticism right here. Throws off his back foot right there, the defenseless oh. receiver. And again, just helmet on helmet right there. One more look at it here. This is Tomlin. Nice touch, great concentration here, the catch. Mm. Tomlin also gets hit. Watch this at the end of the play. That's a takedown. That could have been roughing the passer on that end. Ivan Staples, the defensive tackle, got to him, and you see the bloody nose for Eric Johnson, who made his 16th catch of the season and paid the price for it, too. Yeah, he did. Now targeting the call. So a 15-yard mark off on top of the first down catch. Good job there by Johnson to hold on to the ball. And we talked about again, momentum shift again. Southwest to cab. Nice job on offense here. Good mix of run and pass, a penalty. You're out near midfield now. So first and 10 for Southwest DeKalb, ball at their own 48, following their first third down conversion of the night, and then the penalty tacked on top of it. Tomlin steps up in the pocket under a heavy rush, being chased, and he's gonna go down at the 45-yard line, another quarterback sack for the Stevenson Jaguars, and Aaron Sterling with his 17th sack of the season. 
Yeah, I just watched this. We talked about this great defensive line led by Sterling. And that's the question, can Tomlin uh, stay away from them? There he is right there. Boy, he's just a big boy. Samuel Cambridge, a 6'2", senior linebacker in on the tackle as well, but Sterling leading the chase. Boy, he's got good wheels for kids 6'2", 255. You can see now why so many top Division I programs are calling. Yeah, plays defensive tackle for Stevenson. He'll be projected as a defensive end at the next level. Mm, he's got the speed for it. Second down now and 11 from the 47. Tomlin stands in there, fires high, and nearly intercepted. Was looking for JV and Cody, and Eugene Brown back on the play, nearly had the pick, and it's going to be third down. Tough play right there. It's a tough pass. Sail it high, you leave your receiver defenseless. So third down and 11 coming up from the 47, I'm sure. Cody didn't appreciate that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Little words. Especially against this hard-hitting Stevenson defensive team that's willing to rip you in two if they get the chance. There's the screen pass to Eastling, and Eastling dropped at the 46-yard line by Cambridge. Going to be short of the first down. Let's see if Tanks goes for it here on fourth down and four or whether they elect to punt. So the punt team out looks like. That is the smart thing to do, and Michael Tanks comes out to punt. Coach's son and backup quarterback. 22 kicks for Tanks on the season, 42.6 yard average. Yeah, they're a man short, only 10 men on the field. You see Tanks waving for another player to come out. You have a delay of game, looks like. Sean Jolly is standing deep for Stevenson. So both teams having some issues in terms of just execution. And it looks like that they changed Stevens out. They yeah. changed out personnel. Yeah, I think Stevenson might have gotten caught with their regular defense on the field on fourth down there because once they had the penalty, they completely changed uh, personnel. Yeah, line drive kick by Tanks goes out of bounds. I don't know that they were caught. I just think that they thought that Southwest DeKalb might go for it there uh -huh. on fourth and four. Uh -huh. And so they had their regular defense out. And then when it became fourth and nine, they brought Maybe out that point. the return team. Yeah, so point. time out on the field. Opening six minutes at Halford Stadium. Panthers band got it revved up and going. <laughs> And Stevenson will be on offense when we get back. Football Fridays in Georgia on GPB is made possible in part by Regions Bank. It's time to expect more. Georgia's Electric Membership Corporation, lighting the way. Technical College System of Georgia, learn more, earn more. Cigna, together all the way. And viewers like you, Thank you. The insurance industry is a relationship business. I try to be out in the community, you know, as much as I possibly can. We're local agents in the community. We're part of the community. I love doing business in the town that I live in. My clients are my friends. They can just step in my office and say hello. That's very important to me. We want to be available to them in case they need us. You get a lot of reward personally going home at night knowing that you've taken care of folks. Welcome back, Halford Stadium. Halfway through the first quarter, Stevenson and Southwest DeKalb are scoreless in 5A, and let's kick it and show you what's going on in 6A. We're going to take our first visit down to Region 1, let you know what's going on at the hog pen. Believe it or not, Tiff County had a quick 3-0 lead in this game, but Calkwood has responded two touchdowns in two minutes and 15 seconds, and you see the Packers driving on offense, a big hole down to about the 30-yard line, so their offense is rolling right now. This could have been a trap game tonight as they wait for Camden next week to decide the region title. That's our first look in Region 1, 6A. Let's send it back upstairs. All all right, thank you, Nelly. Two touchdowns in two minutes and 15 seconds. What took him so long? <laughs> That's exactly I mean, Rush Probst needs to work on that offense. That's taken way too long. 
for the Packers to score some touchdowns. <laughs> they are a fun team to watch, no doubt about it. We they had are. the great opportunity to go down there to Moultrie a couple of weeks ago and watch them play. Nothing doing on the carry by Tristan Kinsler. Big time tackle right there. <laughs> a little excited there. Harris Walker, one more look at it. Again, he's done a nice job. It's a couple of nice plays he's made on defense. Great job of just, uh, again, sealing up the hole, getting into the backfield and stopping him for a loss. Harris Walker, the six foot sophomore linebacker. Actually playing defensive tackle here tonight. And Tristan off to the races. Kinsler across the 50 oh. yard line, oh. broke a tackle. He's going to go. Wow. Tristan Kinsler with an 86 yard touchdown run. Wow. Well, just when you think you got him, and again, let's go back again in terms of. Uh, <laughs> off the top. Uh, we mentioned again at the top of the telecast, Jalen Marson Knight, their leading rusher out tonight with an injured elbow. Doesn't matter. We saw the big 43-yard run earlier in the first series, and then that one, 86 yards. Boy, once he turned on the afterburners, he was gone, man. Tisdale on for the PAT. And he converts with a knuckleball through the uprights. And Stevenson has a 7-0 lead. Here's a look at your TCSG touchdown replay. Yeah, here it is. Watch again on the left side. The top of your screen is what we're going to look at here. Your TCSG touchdown replay. Big handoff right there. He gets some good blocking in front. And watch the afterburners right here. Only one man really to stop him. And you can't tackle him high. you got to hit him low. He is gone at that point. Tristan Kensler, the 5'9 senior, 86 yards at Pater. This one coming right at you this time. Look at the gaping hole right there. Just like we saw in that one, uh, the opening up play, the 43-yarder. Nice little short stiff arm to fight off the would-be. Tackler right there, 86 yards later. Stevenson draws first blood. Big time block out on the edge by the pulling guard, Kenneth Johnson, yep. to open up that gaping hole. Just two plays, 84 yards, and it was actually an 86-yard touchdown run after they lost a couple of yards on the very first play. And you're right, Jalen, Marson, Knight, their top rusher out, and, well, they look like they're okay. Got Antonio Woods and Tristan Kinsler have both broken off big runs already in this game. Ball picked up by Eastling way back at the nine-yard line. He's dancing, and he gets his ticket punched. Yeah, that's never good once you start Shifting, <laughs> shifting positions, one side, next side, you're not going anywhere. So after giving up the 86-yard touchdown run, the Southwest DeKalb offense in a deep hole. Yeah, yeah this, this is not, you just saw a bunch of big, fast white shirts. <laughs> not a pretty sight. Frightening on Halloween Eve. Those, because those ghosts hit hard. Yeah. <laughs> So first and 10 from the nine yard line for Justin Tomlin in the Panthers offense. Eastling coming to the near side. Eastling has a first down, gets dropped at the 21 yard line. Tackle made by Carlito Gonzalez, the safety who's committed to Auburn. It's a nice play here on first down. Just give it to your back, let him use his good speed to get around the end. First down run and then some. Hold on to the ball upon contact. It's a nice run. You know, Southwest DeCamp has moved the ball uh, here as they start their second series rather well uh, here in the first quarter. There's no points to show for it yet. Indeed they have. So first and 10 at the 23-yard line. They were able to get the ball to the Southwest DeCamp, or rather, pardon me, the Stevenson 44-yard line on their first possession, then had to give it up. Tomlin rolling to his right, being chased, firing on the run, and nearly intercepted out there on the edge by Eugene Brown, trying to get the ball to Eric Johnson, who got or took that big hit from Eugene Brown on the previous possession, but back out there on the field. Good yeah, see. 
I'm sorry, Matt, I'm going to cut you off the replay here. This is one thing he's got to really be careful of is he had decent protection right there, but once you run out, you bring the speed of that front seven of Stevenson into play. That almost was an interception right there because of that. You just got a lot of uh, big, strong athletes on the defensive side of the ball. He's going to be really careful of that. Maybe not break out of the pocket so much, but step up into it, maybe for a run, and then try to find somebody underneath. So second down and 10. Eight minutes in at James Holford Stadium. Stevenson on top, 7-0. Heavy rush. They set up the screen pass. Actually, we're not setting up a screen pass. I thought they were. It had all the looks of a screen pass, Larry, but instead an incompletion as Javian Cody was the intended target. Yeah, that was one. He's, and he's going here and talk to the coach again. You know, the, the best, most successful play they've had so far, the pass play, was that screen. Now I'm going to try to exploit that a little bit more and try to keep that front seven honest because they're bringing such push with their defensive line, their linebackers, and almost blitzing every time uh, that it's going to leave some, some guys open underneath. So, you know, have that running back, get the initial block on alignment, and then step off again, get ready for the screen pass, set that up, and get some positive yards. we got a flag on the play right here that's down. Not sure what the call is. Yeah, illegal man downfield. Gary Williams is our referee tonight. And you can see how that illegal man downfield would occur as they were look like they looked like they were trying to set up a screen, right, right. but it wasn't a screen. Right. So your blockers are, you know, they're starting to run downfield to set up for a screen. And so obviously some miscommunication there between the quarterback and the play call. sort things out right now. Well, there's no question when you televise a Stevenson and or Southwest DeKalb game, you're going to have plenty of a company. Yeah. Because <laughs> they will not stop. <laughs> and they haven't. Oh, there they went. <laughs> no, they haven't. Well, they still haven't. That's right. They keep something going the whole <laughs> That's time. That's right. <laughs> So third down and 10 now for Tomlin and the Panthers. And again, the play gets blown dead. Now this time it's against Stevenson, it looks like. Encroachment the call. So this makes this a little bit more manageable third down for the Panthers. Third down and five from just across the 25, near the 26. Yeah, right there. Step up. Oh, oh. and intercepted at the 28-yard line. Intercepted. Nigel Grant. Nigel Grant comes up with the interception. What a big play. This is what I wanted to see, though. I wanted to see him kind of step up, but instead, just never saw him there. He was trying to get the receiver behind him for a first down. Instead, he went right into the arms of Grant. One more look at it. Yeah, step up through that pressure. That's the right move. This is not. He tried to thread the ball right there to his receiver, Eric Johnson. Back. Good to see him back in the game after getting uh, that cut on his nose with that hard hit. Interception, and Stevenson in great field position. And off goes Antonio Woods, and Woods will be stopped after about a three or four yard gain. Tackle made by Tylen Walker. We talked about Stevenson at the very top in our extra point segment, Matt, about the Jaguars averaging 240 yards rushing a game. They're already over 130 yards here. Uh, just in these first nine minutes. That's a 43-yarder, 40, 86-yarder. That's that's just the, those two plays. So second down and five coming up. Play action. Shepard fires, got a man wide open for a touchdown. That was easy pickings right there. Hassan Littles with the touchdown catch. 
Well, that's just a real smart play right there. Again, we talked about just right before the snap, the running game and all the yards uh, they've run on virtually every play. I think maybe only the first or second pass play they've attempted here in the quarter. But you do the play action that draws your linebackers in, watching the running back, and that left that back, that uh, wide open space right there. He just walked into the end zone with a touchdown. Tisdale on for the PAT, and he nails it right through there. And just nine minutes into this game, it's now a 14-0 lead as we take a look at the TCSG touchdown replay. Yeah, great job here by the Stevenson Jaguars, taking advantage of that, that interception, the turnover. Nice look right there again, just a great play. To get the touchdown, Xavier Shepard looking for his man. Hassan Littles. One more look at it right here. The play action again is what sets it up. Everyone freezes right there. No one looking downfield. All eyes on the defense on the running back as they burned you so many times running in this first quarter. And that sets up the easy touchdown pass. At that point, it's just a timing pattern like you've worked on all year long in practice. So Stevenson taking advantage of the turnover. And all of a sudden, Southwest DeKalb has their work cut out for him, 14-0 very early on in this game. And Stevenson, boy, what a job they've done on offense and defense. Eastling will take it at the 10-yard line. And Eastling gets dropped by Michael Makins at the 25-yard line as we check in with John Nelson. And we're going to head down to the coast as we kick it this time. We're going to go to Region 3A, sub-Region A, where it is senior night, Calvary Day and Savannah Country Day. Calvary Day after a 21-0 league. Nolan Smith with the touchdown that made it 14-0. And this is a battle for second place in the sub-region. Everyone chasing Savannah Christian, who's 4-0 in the sub right now, 7-1 overall. But Savannah Christian's leading Claxton 21-0. So it's tough sledding for both of these teams tonight. Right, back upstairs. Thank you, Nelly. First and 10 for the Panthers. Down two touchdowns now as they start from their 25-yard line. Just under three minutes to play here in the first quarter. It's been all Stevenson thus far. A couple of really big plays, big runs. 43-yard run by Antonio Woods. They didn't get any points out of that. Missed a field goal. And then an 86-yard touchdown run by Kinsler, followed by an interception by Nigel Grant, and then a 22-yard reception by Little. So three big plays on offense and a big play on defense. And I think the pressure, as we go back and we look at this offense, I, I think Tomlin, the sophomore, really bothered by the pressure uh, directly and indirectly. He's not a very good thrower, at least. He has not been accurate when he throws on the run. So he needs to be a guy that sets his feet. When he throws on the run, he loses a lot of his accuracy. And he's 72% on his passes this year. So obviously Stevenson wants to flush this guy, make him throw uncomfortably on the run. Nothing doing right there. Another big hit. Amari Andrews on the tackle of Eastling. Yeah, again, I'd like to see a couple of screen plays again. You see the blitz coming, just set up to where you just, you let them come at you, throw the ball over their heads, get it to a receiver or one of your backs out of the backfield and just get some positive yards just to move the ball down the field and force that defensive front seven to stay home. And that'll, give, that'll free up your, you know, your passing game, give you more time in the pocket to, to go through your progressions, find your receiver, and not have to throw in the run, as you mentioned, make those good, smart decisions uh, from just a, a, the pro, pro style uh, stance with the backfield. Second down and 14. Complete out here to Cody, and Cody gets hit out of bounds at the 25-yard line as he picks up about five yards on the play close to the original line of scrimmage. Yeah, see, this wasn't the prettiest play, but it's effective. Again, another bad snap that throws things off, but he re he's a good athlete, recovers well, goes down and gets that snap, gets something positive. He could have, been a, could have fumbled the ball for a, a loss of six, seven yards. Instead, he gets some positive yards out of it. So third down and 10. Panthers averaged 399 yards of offense per game. 220 through the air and 170 on the ground. 
Eastling on the catch, and Eastling just back to the original line of scrimmage. Nothing doing. Andrews there making the tackle again. Yeah, that wasn't there, but just because the pass was low and, and he had to go down and get it. But if that's a good pass, that's positive yards, maybe even a first down on that play. Punt taken by Littles, and Littles gets thrown to the ground at the 44-yard line. And Kamara, Ismaila Kamara, the junior. Nice tackle there to say what could have been a big gain. That was a short punt. Picked it up perfectly on the hop. Littles, who scored that last touchdown of the touchdown catch. Short gain, but still at Stevenson already starting in Southwest DeKalb territory once again. Fourth possession of this game already. Three of them have been at midfield or better for the Jaguars. So first and 10 for Stevenson from the Southwest DeKalb, 44. Antonio Woods on the carry. Picks up about three yards on the play. Nice job by Woods there to avoid getting brought down in the backfield. Very impressed with this Jaguars offense. Woods four carries for 50 yards so far tonight. 43 of those came on the first snap of the game. Tristan Kinsler on the inside handoff. Picks up a couple of yards on the play down to the 39 yard line. Kind of a different looking play right there. Almost like he kind of did a fake pull of a couple players, make it look like it's going to go this way and try to throw the blockers off. The tacklers, I should say, the defense. It's that crisscross inside handoff, so much a staple of the old wing tee offense. Yeah. You just don't see many teams run the no. wing tee anymore. You don't. Most teams run in the spread. That's what it, 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 it's not quite as difficult to prepare for as the triple option, but nearly. Sideline warning coming up here for Southwest DeKalb. And that's the end of the first quarter. Stevenson hit Southwest DeKalb with big plays and a smothering defense. Tristan Kinsler took it 86 yards to the house. And then Shepard found Littles for a touchdown. 14 0 as we head to the second. He brings out the best in all of us. What is by moonlight and empty field is by the magic of electricity, Sacred Ground. As the official energy provider of the GHSA, Georgia's electric membership cooperatives proudly support our student athletes. We are there, illuminating the glory moments fans just have to see. Capturing the hustle, elevating champions, sharing the win. Georgia's EMCs, empowering our youth, lighting the way. Exercise. You choose the salad occasionally, but staying well, physically, financially, emotionally, is hard on your own. So Cigna's got your back 
and your needs 24 7. Cigna is there to answer your questions. Or when you need some coaching. In sickness and in health, Cigna is there, helping you to get well and stay well. That's having a partner who's with you all the way. Cigna. The annual Lights, Lights celebration kicks off the holiday season in historic downtown Moultrie, Thanksgiving night, November 26th at 6 p.m. Brought to you by City of Moultrie Main Street Program and Downtown Moultrie Association. DowntownMoultrie.com. Start of the second quarter here at Halford Stadium. Stevenson leading Southwest to cab 14-0. Winner clinches a spot in the state playoffs in two weeks. Matt Stewart along with Larry Smith, John Nelson, and the GPB Army. Third down and five coming up for the Jaguars here from the Southwest to cab 39. Shepard rolling and throwing, and that is complete, but maybe not enough for the first down. No. Going to be short by about a yard. Well, what a great job there by the defense, knowing exactly where that marker was and making sure that he was not going to cross it and bring up a fourth and short now for Stevenson. Nuru Tench with the catch. Tench, a sophomore that's probably one of the best athletes on this team. And one of the reasons why, along with this very underclassman backfield that uh, Ron Gartrell excited about next season too. On fourth down they go for it and Tinch gets stopped at the line of scrimmage. He'll be close depending upon the spot. It's going to be very close. And Tinch is hurt on the play. Or is that Tinch? Woods. Antonio that, Woods, I that's think. 28. Tench was the ball carrier, and Woods appears to be hurt on the play. And they have decided without a measurement that it is a first down. They've already moved the chains, but now the big question right now for the Jaguars is how serious is this injury here by Antonio Woods? Yeah, this would be another tough break for a Stevenson team that lost Jalen Marson Knight, their top rusher, last week to a, to a hyperextended elbow. He's not playing tonight, and now Woods, they're looking at his... Left leg, his left knee. Let's take a look at the 5A poll as they tend to Antonio Woods. And you see Mays ranked number two in the state in the GPB 5A top 10. Winner of tonight's game plays Mays for the Region 6 Championship next Friday night at Lakewood Stadium here in Atlanta and right here on GPB. Now look at that Mays right there, number two. Stevenson right now tied for fifth. This score holds up. It's those two again next week. What a powerhouse matchup that would be. Another big game tonight. 10th ranked Northgate at 8 0 playing Stars Mill, also oh. 8 0. Yeah. Two unbeaten teams. And the winner of that ball game between Northgate and Stars Mill will play number three Stockbridge next week for the Region <laughs> 4 championship. Wow. It's a fun time of year. Yeah, got a lot of unbeaten, highly ranked teams colliding here the final two weeks of the season. So a first down for Stevenson. Handoff goes to DeBose. First carry of the night for DeBose. Tackle made by Michael Tanks. And DeBose is a Tanks. 5'10, 200. He's a big boy. Second down and six coming up following the four yard pickup. 100. And 64 yards of total offense for Stevenson in the first quarter. Only 36 for Southwest DeKalb. Tinch in motion, now heads back the other way. And nothing doing right there on that carry by Kinsler. And now some pushing and shoving going on at the end of the play. A lot of talking. <laughs> See that very big offensive line for Stevenson. They've always got D1 prospects. Number 74 up there, you see him? He's just a sophomore. That's Dylan Wanham. 
275. He's hard to miss. He's the younger brother of Dennis Wanham, the tight end and defensive end who's committed to Iowa State, but he's just a sophomore. Needless <laughs> to say, he's going to be a big time prospect. Yes, he is. <laughs> it's a big boy. Third down and five. Shepard going to the end zone, got a man open. Touchdown catch for Khalil Newton. Well, Stevenson right now well in control of this game as we're just in the early minutes here of the second quarter. Second touchdown pass for Xavier Shepard. So we check it out, the TCSG touchdown replay. Watch this. Shepard here, nice job. Waits for Newton to break free. And it's just a timing pattern from that point on. Newton with good speed on the outside. 20-0 lead now for the Jaguars. And make with the extra kick, extra point kick, makes it 21-0. Let's head down to John Nelson. New round of kicking it. We're going to spend some time in Region 3, 5A, one of the toughest regions around, and someone is going to be disappointed, probably two teams disappointed. Right now, Ware leading South Effingham 12-7. You've got six teams going for four spots right now in Region 3, 5A, and odds are that the loser tonight is probably out of the mix. South Effingham, 5-1 and one and 7-1. and one. Ware, 4-2 and two and 6-2. and two. Going to keep an eye on this one in Region 3-5A. This one's going to be a tough loss for somebody by the time the night is done back upstairs. Thank you, Nelly. You know, four teams in each region make the state playoffs, and you think, wow, no one can get disappointed. That's a lot of teams out of each region. That's 32 teams yeah. in each classification. But every year, there's one or two very deserving teams that don't make it. So competitive. That's why this time of year is so much fun. So many teams work so hard to get here and get to this point, and still, the work isn't done. Eastling will take it at the 16-yard line, and Eastling up the far sideline gets tripped up at the 41-yard line, falls forward to the 45 as Sean Jolly made that tackle on special teams, and good field position for a Panthers team now down three touchdowns. Yeah, he saw a lot of green ahead of him. Disappointed, can't believe he got caught from behind. One more look at it. Eastling's got good speed, too. Turns on the after Jets. Oh, and he thought he had it. Yeah, Eastling is their top rusher. Came in with 565 yards on the ground this season. Just under eight yards per carry. And another 164 through the air. So over 700 yards of total offense for Eastling, the junior. Pardon me, the senior running back. So first and 10 from the 45-yard line. Eastling gets the catch. Uh, no such luck right there. Matthew Ellis Smith, the cornerback, Ellis White, Matthew Ellis White, making the tackle. Loss of yardage on the play. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Eastling is so fast, but guess what? So are these Jaguar defenders. The idea, again, it's a smart play. Try to get the ball in his hands as many chances as you can. We saw him earlier on a running play with the speed to get around the end, but those defensive backs were just too tough, too fast for Stevenson. All right, so Larry, figure out this equation. They've got so much speed you can't get around the edge. Yeah. And then they've got so much beef right there in the middle, you can't run it up the middle. No. So what do you do against this team? Uh, I go back to, again, try to some screen plays. <laughs> try, try to throw it short and just get, try to get five, six, seven yards each time if you can, um, at least just to get some moment, momentum going. Yeah. I think if you get a two or three first downs, uh, that defense can't pin its ears back now. It'll kind of settle in, and, and uh, you can kind of maybe, again, change plays up. But right now, just try to just get some positive yards. You see the dominating story in total yards for Stevenson here tonight as another flag drops. I mean, this is a Stevenson defense you're trying to move the ball on that's given up 25 points, Larry, during their six-game winning streak, and they've thrown four shutouts. They are Johnny Cueto. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Complete game shutout. They're going the distance. Uh, and five more yards against Southwest Academy. Again, it's what we're talking about in terms of right now. Southwest Academy is the one that we saw Stevenson with a shaky start early on, execution-wise. Now Southwest Academy is the one's having problems. No luck running the ball right there. East lean on the carry. Yeah, I just don't know right now if that works because I mean, again, the Jaguars—they're just—they're just pinning their ears back. They're bringing everybody up, up the box. You watch him line up. They've got a lot of guys there up front. 
Um, and, and they're, you know, they're so big and strong, they're dominating that front line. You've got to find a way to get the ball past that line. Yeah, that was actually Francisco Hunter on the carry that time for the Panthers. His first carry of the ball game. They keep both backs in to pass protect, hit as he throws, jump ball, nearly intercepted. I mean, they kept both backs in on pass protection. That is max pass protection for Southwest to cap, and Stevenson still got a man in his face. Yeah, well, in that time there, they only only rushed four with the third and 18. You watch the replay on this, watch this. It's just four, only four men rushing, and yet it, I, I guarantee you, to the young quarterback, Tomlin, it felt like eight. <laughs> They're so big and fast. Fourth down, punting situation. Oh. Tanks, heavy rush, gets it away, kicks it over the head of Littles, who has to go back to get it. Instead, we'll let it roll. And it rolls dead at the 15-yard line, and that's where Stevenson will go on offense. Well, great job right there by Tanks just to get that ball off, that bad snap. Could have been disaster. Check in with Nelly again. A couple of scoring updates as we bounce around the state. Miller Grove in your subregion, as we've been talking about here in Division A. Miller Grove, a winner tonight over Druid Hills by the score of 21-7. So that makes them 3-2 and two and 6-3. and three. Also on the board, St. Pius leading Stone Mountain now 35-6 with 6.42 to go in. Also, Tucker and Lovejoy. Tucker right now, Chris Broadwater with the 24-yard run. They lead Lovejoy 7-0, 8.49 and counting in the first. That game at Historic Adams Stadium in DeKalb County back upstairs. All right, Nelly, that uh, Miller Grove final, not good news for Southwest DeKalb as Miller Grove now three and two in the region. Southwest DeKalb with a loss here tonight would also be three and two. And Miller Grove beat Southwest DeKalb 35-0, so they lose the tiebreaker on that one. Shepard on the run. And Shepard dropped at the 18-yard line. As we mentioned at the top, that's one of those situations that Southwest DeKalb doesn't want to see itself in if it loses tonight because right. it does fall into that tie-break situation, and they need a lot of things to fall their way to get into the playoffs if that happens. So second down and seven. The other score they'll be watching intently tonight is MLK. The Lions are playing at Dunwoody tonight. Now, they do own a tiebreaker with MLK, but... If it falls into a three-way tie, then the tiebreaker is nullified because they've all beaten each other. So second down, Kinsler on the run. He's got a chance to break another one. Cuts back to the near side, and Kinsler dropped at the 50-yard line. Another nice run for Tristan Kinsler as Jonathan Green made the tackle in open space. And once again, you've got the top two running backs out of the game right now due to injury, and so here you go, Kinsler. And look what he does. Again, no blue shirts touch him until right there in midfield. That's already the third run, the third carry tonight for Stevenson at 30 yards or more. And they're getting close to the 200-yard mark in a total offense. You see Antonio Woods getting ice wrapped on that left knee. Not a good sign right there. Looks like he may be done for the night. Five carries, 118 yards for Kinsler so far tonight. Hate to see that. 32-yard run right there. Shepard hands off Kinsler again as Kinsler gets tripped up at the 45-yard line and falls forward to the 43. That was Corey Hernandez making the tackle for the Panthers. Watch this, watch this one more time. So watch Southwest DeKalb. See, they're still trying to get their defense in place even before he gets the ball. See, and number seven's out of position. Uh, right there, that was uh, Michael Tanks trying to tell Francisco Hunter, hey, you got to get over there. He didn't get a job, didn't get over there. And as a result, he gets blocked. And it's a decent gain for the Jaguars. Second down and four. Maybe too much movement here on offense. That was the tight end, Dennis Wanham, who was in motion behind the line, and the penalty is illegal motion. Fourth penalty for 30 yards against Stevenson. Not that it has hurt them on the scoreboard tonight. <laughs> no, it hasn't. Stevenson's had a great job on both sides of the ball, controlling the line of scrimmage. 
interception in the first half. They turned it into six points. Uh, two plays later, 58 seconds later, made it 14 0. Nice job right here by the Jaguars. Shepard rolling, getting it downfield. It is caught at the 32 yard line. That might go. And Khalil Newton scores his second touchdown of the night. Oh, and how about their quarterback, Xavier Shepard? You know, we came in talking about the passing game for DeCamp, for Southwest DeCamp, but all of a sudden now on your TCSG touchdown replay, it's number 12, Xavier Shepard. Watch this right here. Smart play, runs, gets the ball where it needs to be, and then lets his receivers do the rest. Poor tackling right there by the defensive backs, but again, this Southwest DeCamp team, very young, and just too much speed on the other side. Khalil Newton, his second touchdown catch of the night. It's a 27-0 game right now in the second quarter. That goes for 50 yards. Tisdale with the PAT, and Stevenson has a 28-0 lead. Four-play, 85-yard drive for the Stevenson Jaguars. And Xavier Shepard has three touchdown passes in the first half. Here, beauty is a lot more than skin deep. For more than 100 years, we have focused on creating individual success stories. This is a place where professors are mentors, competition is cheered, collaboration counts, experience is hands-on, and connections are lifelong. VSU, over 100 majors, championship athletics, focused on your success. The new College Football Hall of Fame and Chick-fil-A fan experience puts fans closer to the game experience. Featuring over 30,000 square feet of college football interactive exhibits. Tickets available at CFBHall.com. Five possessions, four touchdowns, and one missed field goal add up to a 28 to nothing lead for Stevenson here with just under five minutes to play in the first half. Every week on GPB, Georgia Traveler crisscrosses the state looking for the most fun, friendly, and often free activities to enjoy with the entire family from Atlanta to Savannah, the mountains to the coast. See all the best Georgia has to offer on Georgia Traveler now on Thursdays at 8 o'clock only on GPB. Four plays, 85 yards for Stevenson. And they have just had a bevy of big plays tonight. 86-yard touchdown run by Kinsler. 30 and 50-yard touchdown catches by Newton. 22-yard touchdown catch by Littles. Interception by Grant. And even a 43-yard run by Antonio Woods that ended up resulting in the missed field goal on their opening possession. And you're right, Larry, we started this game talking about Tomlin, the leading passer in the counting for Southwest DeKalb, but Shepard is the guy that's stolen the show. Yeah, he's just shown nice poise. Of course, he's getting great blocking, and that, that makes a big difference when you have time to look for those receivers. But he seems to be in sync with, uh, with his receivers at every turn. Eastling has to go back and pick it up at the two-yard line, and he's going to get dropped at the seven. That is the second time that Eastling has either bobbled a ball or let it get by him. And as a result, Southwest DeKalb has had to start inside the 10-yard line. That was a big tackle by Tavius Butts. Well, again, now the question is, if you're Southwest DeKalb, what do you do to start to, to get some offense going? Their first couple of drives, uh, they did a much better job of moving the ball. But since that interception, it turned into the second touchdown for Stevenson. It just feels like a different different flow on the Southwest DeKalb side on offense, like they really don't have as much. Not quite as sure uh, of, of their of their passes and plays. And it seems feels like they're playing like 11 on 13. It just seems like there are just more Jaguars out there than there are Panthers. So first and 10 for the Panthers, way back inside their own seven yard line and in a deep hole on the scoreboard as well. Tomlin had no place to go with it but to throw it out of bounds. 
Well, you can sense his frustration too, that things just not working. Everywhere he goes, he gets, he feels a pocket collapsing, gets out of that. Here come more guys chasing after him. And then he thinks he has a receiver, gets ready to throw, and here comes a, one of those fast defensive backs to close the gap. So a bit gun shy maybe after the interception. And the county's leading passer now, four of 10 for 23 yards and one pick. Second down and 10. Heavy rush, Sterling after him, and Sterling throws him to the ground. Second quarterback sack of the night for Aaron Sterling and his 18th of the season. Yeah, and they only really rushed three men that time. The, the fourth got to stay back. Watch watch the defensive line here. Watch the white shirts. Well, we can see right on this angle. There's one, two, three guys your screen. The fourth is being held up over there, being double teamed. One more look at it. See, watch right in here. There's only four white shirts. This guy right here is being double teamed. Well, you got a guy like Sterling, doesn't matter. Sterling, the number one make that number 21 rated defensive end in the class of 2017 by the 24-7 sports composite rankings and a timeout called by Southwest DeKalb. I don't know if we've got the time to go back and freeze frame that last sequence, that high angle camera that we had just to kind of show again the defensive pressure they're getting. And this is the reason why Southwest DeKalb is having so much trouble moving the ball because they've got so many guys up. They were bringing a lot more guys up front. Now they're laying the linebackers back. And so there's a running play. They're running and filling the gap. And so your running backs aren't getting very far. On your passing game, they're only rushing three, maybe four guys uh, to try to get something going. Uh, and, and they're making all kinds of pressure there. They still have their guys laying back on defense. And they're causing all kinds of problems for this young, uh, young uh, Panther offense. Let's check in with John Nelson. Let's we'll spend some time in AAA with two of the cool towns when it comes to football. Pierce County and Dodge County. This one has been back and forth. Right now, it's 31-28. It was 28-24 Pierce. Now it's 31-28 the other way. This is at the top of Division A in Region 1 AAA. Dodge in the GPB poll at 5-0 and 8-0. Pierce County at 4-1 and 6-2. And and Pierce County needs the win to close the gap a little bit to have a chance for the region title. Dodge County in the red. They are looking to make sure that they get the one seed in the crossovers for next week. That's it. your first look at AAA back upstairs. So third down and 12. Panthers one for five on their third downs here tonight. Two more sacks for the Jaguars tonight, both of them by Sterling. 35 total sacks for the Stevenson team. That's four per game. There he is again. And they nearly got another oh. one, and they nearly got an interception. Sterling had him in the grasp, slinging him around, and nearly intercepted by Amari Andrews, and it's fourth down. Would you mention they've got so much speed and power in that front line? Who do you double team? When we look at this again, watch number five. Just overpowers this man right around him. Has the speed and agility to still get to the quarterback and almost forces an interception right there by Tomlin. We got a nightmarish night. Punt is blocked. That. And it's going to be picked up by Stevenson finally, or yeah, Stevenson's got it at the 20. And I don't know that Stevenson blocked that. I think Tanks kicked it into the backside of his blocking back. Yep, I think you're right. We'll check the replay and see, but I think you're exactly right. I, Clearly there was pressure there, but watch this very closely. I think he right kicked there, it right into, right into his, his player. His up back. Yep. yep. Right off his shoulder pad. Kicked it right into JV and Cody. And that's the pressure. I mean, let's, yeah. uh, you know, the pressure by Stevenson forced him to rush his kick, and Cody was trying to adjust his position to get to the pressure coming off the edge and kind of floated right into the kick. Yeah. And as a result, again, great field position for the Jaguars. So from the 20-yard line, toss goes to DeBose. And DeBose gets stopped at the 16-yard line. Jawan Long making the tackle. Pick up a four on the play for DeBose, the 5'10", 200 senior. And it's second down and six.
That inside handoff again to Kinsler. And Kinsler down to the 10 yard line. Well, nice job there by Juwan Long to make that tackle and the Southwest and Cab defense to stay home on that. It's one of the keys we talked about early on in the game was staying home, stopping that wing tee. Nice job there to make the stop. But Kinsler does pick up the first down on that carry. So first and goal to go now from Stevenson at the 10 yard line. What well, shows you what they've done. They actually got the first down but because it was a short gain. It feels like a success. <laughs> Even yeah. though they still got the first down. You're right, yeah. <laughs> Seven carries, 131 for Kinsler. Wow. Of course, 86 of them came on his touchdown run with five minutes to play in the first quarter. <laughs> Shepard, heavy rush, and that's a quarterback sack back at the 22-yard line. First time the Panthers been able to get to the quarterback, and it was Kamara. Nice job right there by Kamara. We saw him earlier make a nice play on special teams. Nobody blocks if he comes in unimpeded, and Shepard has nowhere to go. Great job to wrap him up, not let him get out of your grasp. A rare defensive star play tonight for the Panthers by Kamara. Ishmaela Kamara with the quarterback sack way back at the 21-yard line as they lose 11 on the play. Second down and goal to go now from the 21. Not sure I recall the last uh, play for negative yards. Because I don't think Stevenson. there have been any. I don't think there has Kinsler, <laughs> that's why you can't recall it. <laughs> Kinsler picks that 11 right back up on the run right up the middle. Brings up third down and goal from the 10. A bit of a hurry up. Triple receivers on the left side. Down to 40 yeah, seconds right to play in here. the half. <laughs> Littles got a block, going to score the touchdown. Yeah. Like touchdown said. for Littles, and how about the block by Newton, who's got two touchdown catches himself, and he throws the big block out on the edge to spring the touchdown. Yeah, that was one you saw right there, the setup, and just a hurry up. They didn't huddle up. They, they really had this play in mind before the last play. Very quickly changed personnel while they were already getting lined up at the line of scrimmage. Southwest DeKalb couldn't adjust to it as a result blocking downfield and the screen pass and the easy touchdown and the fourth touchdown pass now for Xavier Shepard. Two of them to Littles, 22 and most recently 10 yards and two of them to Newton, 30 and 50. And I say as we look at the TCSG touchdown replay, watch number 16 out here for Stevenson. He gets a pat on the back. Look at that yep. beautiful block to spring that touchdown and make it easy. And that was it. Again, you want to watch out here. That's what you're talking about right there. He knows where the ball, and that's just your players being smart, to know where the ball is going and to know that defender is going to react. And really, all he does is take that defender's momentum and just use it against him. Uh, because the defender is not going to go out to an angle to try to catch him on the flat. He's going right at him. And so as a result, he takes that same speed, throws him out of the way, and Little's just walked into the end zone. And what I love about that is here's Newton. He's got a 30 and 50 yard touchdown catch in this ball game. And this time, he's going to be the helper. Yeah. Yeah, I'm helping this time. Great team effort. Not about you, it's about the team and what you can, can do for the team. What a battle we've got coming up next Friday night here on GPB. This Stevenson team, ranked number five in the state, taking on number two Mays for the Region 6 championship and a number one seed in the state playoffs. And we'll have that for you live from Lakewood Stadium next Friday night right here on GPB. Kick fielded at the 46 or make that 36 yard line by Long. Look at Stevenson and their offense. They've been Robert Thomas, pardon me, nearly perfect on offense. As you mentioned, the only blemish was the missed field goal in their opening drive. Touchdowns ever since. I want to take this moment to pass along our prayers and condolences to the Decula family. Family, if you were tuning in to see the Decula. And Archer game tonight. That game was postponed after a tragic car accident took the life of one of their students this morning and left uh, the little brother also in critical condition. They will play that game tomorrow night at the Cula, but the game tonight postponed. And, and uh, DeKalb County graciously opened the doors for us to televise the Stevenson and Southwest DeKalb game tonight. We are thankful for that. But certainly our prayers and condolences to the DeCula family.
at their tragic loss. And I believe they also had a vigil on that football field where they're supposed to play that game tonight at 7 o'clock. And so, as you mentioned, certainly our thoughts and prayers go out to everyone involved and affected by that. Ball up to the 49-yard line. Southwest DeKalb does have one timeout remaining. I think that was their biggest play from scrimmage this quarter. Yeah, they, they started well, but I, I really believe that the disruption of the Stevenson defense and the pass rush pressure, they've just got them all out of sync. Yeah. And they just not have been able to do anything. Michael Pitts gets Hunter on the ground as the half comes to a close. Wow. What a dominating first half for Stevenson. Big plays on offense and on defense, even special teams with a blocked punt. And Stevenson scores 21 points in the second quarter, and they take a 35-0 lead to the halftime locker room. Just an impressive 24 minutes of football, no question. Let's head down to John Nelson, standing by with Ron Gartrell. I'm going to steal Matt Stewart's words here. Very impressive 24 minutes of football from you. Yeah, I don't know if we could have played much better than we did in the first half. Offense uh, uh, did what we wanted to do. We didn't know, we didn't know if we were going to be able to. And uh, defense have really played well. You know, the, the shutout of such an explosive team like this is uh, you know, quite impressive. So I, we're really proud of our defense. And I was going to say defensively, you were getting pass rush and forcing everything to the outside, forcing passes on the run as opposed to having him stay in the pocket and be successful. Yeah, you know, we've been trying to do that all year. You know, a lot of people are running these spreads and they like to keep that offense, that quarterback in the pocket. So we just try to get him out of the comp his comfort zone, and I think we did a good job of that. Thanks for your time, Coach. All right, thank you. Ron Gartrell, head coach of Stevenson. He's up 35 at the break. The halftime show with Mark and Jackie starts right now. Thank you, John. Coming up on the GPB Football Fridays in Georgia halftime show, we will hear from both marching bands, both Stevenson and Southwest DeKalb, and they are both sensational. And they are. We've been listening <laughs> to them all night long. Also, John Nelson will put the principals to the test in our Are You Smarter segment. Also, a coach and a player go head-to-head -head over Georgia law. That and more coming up on the GPB halftime show. Don't go anywhere. from Forest Park High School sparked an interest in me to really push me in education, uh, to be more than just a student athlete. You know, each and every day she challenged me to be a leader, a role model, and somebody positive in our community. I can never uh, thank her enough for, for, for what all she's done for me. And there are teachers just like Miss Garner all over the state of Georgia today. The annual Lights, Lights celebration kicks off the holiday season in historic downtown Moultrie, Thanksgiving night, November 26th at 6 p.m. Brought to you by City of Moultrie Main Street Program and Downtown Moultrie Association. DowntownMoultrie.com Providing safe, affordable, and reliable electricity requires more than bucket trucks and utility poles. These are the faces behind your power. For more than 75 years, Georgia's nonprofit, member owned electric cooperatives have been on a mission to brighten the lives of more than four and a half million Georgians. We are Georgia's EMCs, proudly serving our members, lighting the way. Cotton contributes $2.5 billion to the state's economy annually. It takes more than 60 cotton gins and manufacturers to bring cotton into our everyday lives. Kids always like to stay in the pool a little too long. And when they do get out, covered in goosebumps, you feel the urge to wrap them up. The cozy embrace of cotton does the job. Cotton, the natural choice for Georgia. You exercise. You choose the salad, occasionally. But staying well, physically, financially, emotionally, is hard on your own. So Cigna's got your back and your knees 24-7. Cigna's there to answer your questions. Or when you need some coaching. In sickness and in health, Cigna's there, helping you to get well and stay well. That's having a partner who's with you all the way. Cigna.
Welcome to the GPB Football Fridays at Georgia Halftime Show. We're live from Hallford Stadium. Halftime of the Stevenson Southwest DeKalb game. The Stevenson Marching Band has hit the field already, but first, Jackie Britton is standing alongside with a social media update. Jackie? That's right. Don't forget to connect with us on all social media platforms. That includes Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now Snapchat to see all the behind-the-scenes action happening here on set at Halford Stadium. So you can find us at GPB Sports, and we've been doing a little contest tonight. Who has the best caption for John Nelson trying his hardest to conduct the van the last time we were here at Halford Stadium? We already have a few really good tweets. We want you to keep them coming. Caption this, when you don't have cell phone signal. That is really good. I like that. Okay, when you don't have cell phone signal from Hannah Perry. Then we've got Patrick says, John is directing traffic at the airport. That's pretty good. Okay, I like that one. I put a spell on y'all <laughs> and now you're mine. Hashtag Hocus Pocus. That's pretty good too. Keep the catch captions coming all night long at GPB Sports on Twitter. The best one at the end of the night will be revealed and we'll send you some GPB swag. So be sure to keep up with us on social media at GPB Sports. Time now for our first round of Are You Smarter on this Halloween edition of Football Fridays in Georgia. We check in with John Nelson, who, as always, is in the principal's office. John? Yes, and I'm trying to get past that caption contest as quickly as humanly possible. Mr. Jones and me looking into the future. So what's been going on at Stevenson these days? Obviously, the Sonic sounds behind us, and they're great as always. A lot going on. We just found out that we have the 2015 DeKalb County Softball Player of the Year. Sheila Smith and the 2015 softball coach of the year, Marco Jackson. We, you know, I got APs, I got scholars. They're getting ready for the governor's honors uh, interviews, and you know, we just got a lot going on. But one cool thing we got going on is that we're reading a book school wide, uh, The Battle of Jericho by Sharon, Sharon Draper. And it's great to have a culture of readers at Stevenson, so we're doing a great job. No doubt. It is time to play the game. Are you smarter? A question that I have not seen and am seeing for the first time. So here we go. Which famous mystical performer actually died on Halloween? Is it A, Doug Henning, B, Harry Houdini, or is it C, Karnak the Magnificent? Which one do you think it is? Uh, B, Harry Houdini. That is D, that is correct, as I hear the ding in my ear. He died of a ruptured appendix right. on Halloween, and because you got it right, he gets a treat bag, guys. Can I say hello to my mom? You just did. Hey, Mom, Roberta Jones this time, Savannah, Georgia. That's for first round of Are You Smart? We'll send it back to you guys. <laughs> All right. Hi, Mom. You got to like when the principal checks in back home. Let's check in now with the Stevenson High School Marching Band brought to you by Regions Bank. And that's the Stevenson Marching Band brought to you by Regions Bank. Now time to check in with Jackie Britton, who knows the law and the law one. Jackie? That's right. Well, Ashley is joining me now from Southwest DeKalb. And Ashley, I have a question for you. Is it illegal to keep a donkey in your bathtub in the state of Georgia? It's supposed to be a tough one. True, She's speechless. True. OK. It's so. True. All right, well, we'll see. Earlier this week, we were at Archer High School, and we put a coach and a player head-to-head, -head, see who did or didn't make out so well. <laughs> All right, we are hanging out at the Archer Football Fieldhouse today. I've got offensive line coach Brian Lane here and Connor Sims, center for Archer Football. And are you guys ready for our law-abiding citizen segment? We can't wait. Yeah, we can't wait. Are you sure? 
Oh, I think so, we're good. <laughs> All right, Connor's ready to go, okay. All right, first one. In Columbus, it is illegal to carve your initials into a tree, even if it is your own property. Is this true or false? True. Oh, true. True. All right, hey, you're both right. Okay, ding, ding, one for each. All right, second one. Donkeys Stop looking may... at my answer. <laughs> <laughs> and donkeys may not be kept in bathtubs. Is this true or false? Oh, that's true. It's false. It's actually true. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, it's all right, false. so he's in the lead. He's in the, <laughs> he's in the lead. Okay. All right, this one. In Ackworth, it is illegal to own mice. Is this true or false? Ackworth? I'm going false. Okay. True. It's false. He wins. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. There's yeah. only three? Yeah, there's only wow. three. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm like, will you all right. take all my punishment? Ooh. Yeah, I will. You got squats? You got squats. And you can get him after practice. Gotcha. All right, <laughs> go for it. No, straighten your back out. <laughs> That's, 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 that's good. That's good. That's good. Good job. <laughs> good job, guys. Right. That was great. So there you go. Thankfully, Ashley didn't have to drop in and give me 10 squats, but you look like you could have done it. You were yeah. up for the challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got it right, though. That was good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mark, we'll send it back over to you. All right. At this time, we'd like to thank the superintendent of DeKalb County Schools, Dr. R. Stephen Green, Athletic Director Horace Dunson, and Administrator Jackie Simmons for helping us put this game on the air. GPB Sports thanks you, and football fans around the state of Georgia thank you as well. Now, coming up on the GPB Football Fridays in Georgia Halftime Show, we'll hear from the Southwest DeKalb Marching Band. John Nelson visits Ashburn, Georgia. He checks in with the Turner County High School football team. Plus, we'll get the 411 from some very proud parents. That and scores from around the state. It's all coming up next on the Football Fridays in Georgia Halftime Show right after this timeout. Stay with us on this Halloween Eve. Questions can't wait until morning. So I'm one of many nurses at Cigna with answers anytime, day or night. I'm Lauren and I've got your back. Today, companies in the aerospace, advanced manufacturing, and film industries need skilled workers and the earning potential is high. Go Build Georgia can show you where the jobs are and what skills you need to get them. And the Technical College System of Georgia has fast, affordable training for these great paying careers. Build your blueprint for success at GoBuildGeorgia.com and look to the Technical College System of Georgia to put your plan into action. Aren't you the cutest little thing? Oh, oh. As a strong, stable bank, Regions is always looking for opportunities to boost the vitality of our communities. In addition to offering financial solutions for our customers, we are committed to supporting local initiatives and organizations that help our neighborhoods thrive. Regions is proud to be a partner with GPB in building a better Georgia. The new College Football Hall of Fame and Chick-fil-A fan experience puts fans closer to the game experience. Featuring over 30,000 square feet of college football interactive exhibits. Tickets available at cfbhall.com. She's perfectly healthy. Cigna covers preventive care. That's having your back.
on this Halloween Eve edition of Football Fridays in Georgia's Halftime Show. We're live at Hallford Stadium as the Southwest DeKalb Panthers are hosting the Jaguars of Stevenson. We'll hear from the Southwest DeKalb Band and have scores from around the state. But first, it's time for another round of the game show that's sweeping the state. It's Are You Smarter with John Nelson. John? Yeah, it's time to go with Mr. Glanton this time here in the principal's office. And what is going on at Southwest DeKalb these days, you Reedy and Raider grad, you? Oh, look out now. But a <laughs> Panther for life, for yep. sure. Listen, we just finished homecoming, had a great homecoming week, and tonight we're here celebrating our senior night. Just excited about many of our seniors who are making their way to that transition at the end of the school year, and so we're celebrating academics at Southwest DeKalb tonight. Beauty. It is time to play the game. Are you smarter? Jackie says it's sweeping the state, so we'll take her word for it. Second question here tonight is, in the initial cut of 1931's Dracula, it had to be re-edited because the president of the film company said, A, there wasn't enough blood, B, he didn't like Bella Lugosi's accent, or C, it gave him the heebie-jeebies. Which do you think it was? I'm going to go with A, there wasn't enough blood. Oh. Ooh. It gave him the heebie-jeebies, actually. After viewing the first version of the film, Universal President Carl Lemley Sr. reportedly said it gave him the heebie-jeebies, direct quote, and ordered it be re-edited. By the way, when Bella Lugosi died in 1956, he was buried in the Black Silk Cape. He wore as Dracula. What the heebie-jeebies? I know, really? <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, just for being a, a great sport, he's got his treat bag right there. So it is all good here for another round of Are You Smart? I'll see you guys in a sec. Heebie-jeebies. <laughs> That's a direct quote. <laughs> I like it, the heebie-jeebies. As we know, football games would not be the same without their soundtrack. That, of course, is the marching band. So now we're going to listen in to Southwest DeKalb as they play for us here at halftime. <laughs> That's the best band in all the land, the Southwest Cab Marching Man, brought to you by Regions Bank. Now, here are some scores we're following from around the state on the Georgia EMC scoreboard of the Region of Doom, Region 1, 6A. We have Colquitt County leading Tift County 21-6 in the second quarter. Camden County and Lee County all tied up 7-7 in the second. It is Grayson leading Brookwood 21-10 in the second quarter. It is Roswell and Cherokee tie 21-21 in the second quarter, while Mill Creek leads Norcross 10-0 in the second quarter quarter. Mays, we'll see them next week. They're leading Tri-Cities 27 to 7. It is Cartersville, no trouble with Lafayette, 42 to zip. We've got uh, Lovett and GAC going right now. GAC leading by a touchdown early on. McEachern leads Harrison, 12 to zip. And Valdosta leads Lowndes, 3 to nothing in the second in the Wintersville Classic. It's going to be an action-packed season here on Football Fridays in Georgia. So here is the schedule brought to you by the Georgia EMC next week. And can you believe that next week it is the final week of the regular season? We're cruising right along here. We will be at Lakewood Stadium where the undefeated and second-ranked Mays Raiders will take on the winner of this game you're watching here tonight. And, of course, we're with you all the way through the playoffs and then on to the Georgia Dome for the state championships on December 11th and 12th. GPB is your home for high school football all season long, and you can catch up with those scores from around the state with us here tonight as well on our GPB Sports app. Download it at the App Store. All right, Bella Lugosi. No, I mean John Nelson. He joins us for another edition of Backroads and Backfields, brought to you by the Georgia Cotton Commission. The natural choice for the Georgia. They love that. I'm no, sure they, don't. they love that. I'm sure that. they don't. You hit the road to Ashburn, Ashburn Georgia, Georgia this week. And in the region of doom in single A, what we like to call region two single A, it looks like five teams are going to make it to the final 16 when we get to single A public. And the Turner County Rebels right now, they're in a very special spot, and it's all because of family. Oh. Scout D, Scout D on the hop, let's go, let's go. The last time the Turner County Rebels won more than seven games in a season was their quarterfinals run seven years ago. But this year, under first-year head coach Ben Simmons, they're the team everyone is chasing. The kids bought into it, and, and that's been one, one thing of success. And just to kind of see the kids, you know, see them growing up uh, from time to time. One thing I tell this, this group of kids is really special to me, especially the senior class, because I have a son 
back in Jacksonville who's a senior. So these children are my children. And so the success that he has, success that they have, I just want them all to grow. And it's just been a big, big uplifting thing for me, uh, for my family as well. And I just love, just love, just love Turner County all in all. He turned some things around, attitudes, the way people thought about playing the sport. I mean, he made us feel like we can do things. He, he got us in the mindset, which we could be like, yeah, we can do this. And they're doing it in the toughest region in single A, region two. The athletic program as a whole bought into the new off season program and everyone in Ashburn is seeing the results. Hey, pretty track, pretty track. Stay in relation, don't get in front. Very nasty. Uh, every Friday, um, either team could beat either team on in the night because all of us know each other. I've been playing this type for years. The Rebels haven't won the region since back-to-back -back titles in 2005 and 2006. They're also chasing their first state title in almost four decades. So all these guys who've grown up together know what it means to have a year like this one. Well, we play for the team, for the community, and we just pretty much want to put on a show every Friday night that's home and hope our crowd's loud enough to give, give the other team some adversity. One, two, three, transfer! And Brad Christian with the scoring update down there. 14-6, Turner leads Wilcox at the half. They got a scoop and score as time expired in the first 24 minutes. All right, back roads and backfields brought to you by the Georgia Cotton Commission. The natural choice for Georgia. I can't quite trill it. Yeah. And almost. From Transylvania, okay. Time it. for another edition of what we call Rent Check when we check in with the parents. And Jackie is with one right now. Jackie? Thank you, Mark. I've got Al and Venus Eastling, the parents of Jordan Eastling for Southwest Decad. Very proud parents here tonight, and they are ready to tackle rent checks. So, guys, first question. What is his biggest football achievement? What would Jordan consider the biggest football achievement? Venus. It's, a, it's tough. I'm not going to lie. Um, when I went to the Super Bowl, to, when he was 12 years old, Super Bowl. Okay, it was actually a 78-yard punt return at Druid Hills. Yes. Okay, that's all right. Okay, favorite, favorite movie. What's his favorite movie? Anything? Come on, come on, scramble. Wolf of Wall Street. How's my flow? It's actually Wolf of Wall Street. Okay, all right, it's all right. We're going to let them regroup, make some halftime adjustments. They still get some GPV swag and tickets to the College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta. Oh, and a Halloween candy bag. There you go, you get that too. Mark, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Jackie. Time now for our career play of the game presented by the Technical College System of Georgia. Looking for a career in the medical field? You'll find great job opportunities and free tuition through the Technical College System of Georgia. Learn practical nursing, medical office assisting, pharmacy technology, and many more jobs in need of skilled talent. A free education in 10 high demand industries awaits you at the Technical College System of Georgia. Change your life. TCSG.edu. All right, that's our halftime show here on Football Fridays in Georgia. Time now to toss it back up to the boot to our play-by-play -play team of Matt and Larry. Take her away, guys. All right, thank you, Mark and Larry. What an impressive first half for Stevenson. 35 nothing, and now the Jaguars are 24 minutes away from their seventh consecutive win and their fifth shutout in those seven games. We'll come back and take a look at the first half highlights and get the third quarter started when we get back. Nothing prepares you better for a great career than the Technical College System of Georgia. TCSG colleges produce graduates with the knowledge and training today's top employers are looking for. With campuses across Georgia, state-of-the-art facilities, and outstanding instructors with real-world experience, it's the kind of affordable college education that will fast-track you into a rewarding career. We're building a better future for you. Contact the TCSG College in your area today or go to tcsg.edu. It's hard to believe that something so small, so delicate, can grow to be so vital to Georgia families, businesses, and our economy. Agriculture is Georgia's number one industry, and Ag Georgia Farm Credit is proud to have helped Georgia grow for generations. Look for the Georgia Grown logo at your local grocery store and thank a farmer the next time you sit down for a meal. Ag Georgia Farm Credit, helping Georgia grow for generations. 
You exercise. You choose the salad, occasionally. But staying well, physically, financially, emotionally, is hard on your own. So Cigna's got your back and your knees 24-7. Cigna's there to answer your questions. Or when you need some coaching. In sickness and in health, Cigna's there, helping you to get well and stay well. That's having a partner who's with you all the way. Cigna. Welcome back, getting ready for the second half here with Southwest DeKalb and Stevenson Jaguars up 35 as we head to the final 24 minutes here with Southwest DeKalb head coach Michael Tanks. What do you tell them after a, a 24 minute uh, period like that? I told them they need to find each other. You know, we're kind of in a mess right now. Uh, we're playing individual instead of playing as a team. So I told them they need to find each other because this is a team, uh, team sport. Because there were times where you were getting action to the edge, the running game was going, and the, and the screen game was working, and then defensively they just kept coming at you. Right, right. And like I said before, you know, Guard Trail and his staff does a great job of getting those kids ready to play. Um, and and that, our youth is showing right now, you know, and, and we just got to get better. Thanks for your time, Coach. All right. All right, that's Coach Michael Tanks. He's getting ready for the second 24 minutes. Let's send it upstairs to Matt and Larry with first half highlights and stats. All right, thank you, John. So, Larry, what was more impressive, the offense that put 35 points on the board, four touchdown passes from Xavier Shepard, or the defense that pitched another shutout? Boy, that's pretty tough. That's, that's, that's a toss-up. I would almost go, I guess, the offense. I was really surprised at Shepard and his poise to get the four touchdowns. But that defense came on so strong as the game went on. Really, that interception that turned into yeah. seven points was, to me, was it was that was a telltale difference. Once that happened, that defense just said, you know what, we've got this. They took over and really dominated on their side of the ball and made things happen on the offense. Lots of big plays for the Jaguars on both sides of the ball, especially on offense. It started with the 86-yard touchdown run by Tristan Kinson. Yeah, this was so impressive. Again, you're without the Jalen Mars and Knight doesn't matter. We saw the big 43-yard run earlier. This one, 86 yards to pay dirt. And this team that averages 240 yards rushing on the ground was at 130 early uh, in, in the uh, in the, in the early in the first quarter. And then this is the big play I was talking about right here. Yep. Nice move right there by the young man, uh, Justin Tomlin, to get out of trouble, but he throws it right into the hands of Nigel Grant. Two plays later, the touchdown pass, the first of four in the game by Xavier Shepard right there, the 5'11 junior. And Shepard kept coming. Watch this. Just timing patterns at this point on. Easy to throw there to Khalil Newton for a touchdown pass. And then here he goes again, 50 yards out. Watch this. Stop, good throw, and then the great move right here, and the poor tackling by Southwest DeKalb, a 50-yard score, four touchdown passes by Shepard. We didn't talk about him at all in the pregame, but he was as, as impressive as anybody uh, here on the field tonight. That was Little with the second of his two touchdown catches. He had two, Newton had two, Newton threw a big block on that last touchdown. Yeah. That we just saw, we will have a running clock for the entire second half. As Stevenson, a 35-0 lead, begins the third quarter with the kickoff. And Eastling will be dropped at the 22-yard line as we take a look at the first half stats. 322 total yards for the Jaguars, only 47 for Southwest again. Yeah, this, this is the real surprise for me right here, I think, Matt, that 125 yards passing. We knew this was going to happen in terms of the rushing yards for Stevenson. We talked about that. That's impressive in itself. But just a total domination. And then the defense, 47 yards. That's all they allowed. And they get, of course, the big turnover turning into points as well. Six possessions, touchdowns on five of them. The only time they didn't score was that missed field goal on their opening drive. Justin Tomlin, 4 of 11 passing for 23 yards. And the pickoff by Nigel Grant in that first half. And now the Panthers start on offense from their own. 22 and a half yard line. Completion thrown out on the far edge to the 29 yard line. Catch made by JV and Cody. Yeah, I want to see more of that. I talked about the first half. Just find a way of no huddle right now. Changing things up. I, I like what they're trying to do right here. Throw things around, get some completions, get some yardage, get some first downs. You're not going to get it all back in one play just very slowly, methodically trying to move the ball down the field. It's a nice opening play to start this second half for Southwest DeKalb. Second down and two, and if you're Southwest DeKalb, you start working on things that you're gonna need next week yeah. in your there you go. hopeful playoff game as Tomlin oh. fumbles the ball as he trips and falls down. And Stevenson may have fallen on top of it inside the 35, and 
They have it. Samuel Cambridge, I believe, comes up with the fumble recovery. Well, this, this is really unfortunate because this is exactly what we wanted to see them do. You know, he just lost track of the ball, lost the ball as he uh, stumbled right there. But instead of him trying to run around the defense and into more defenders, run right into the gut of it when your pocket would break down uh, and then find yourself positive yardage. You see where the ball is marked right now. If he hadn't fumbled it, uh, that's a first down. And that's two back-to-back -back positive plays. We haven't seen that from them since uh, the first quarter. Instead, when he goes down, the question right now is they're going to say, is he down? That's the holdup right now in the conference that they're talking about it. Did the ground cause the fumble? That's the question. Well, not in a classical sense. The ground didn't cause the fumble. He stuck the ball on the ground. Uh, he didn't fall and fumble. Right. He stuck the ball on the ground right. a la Clint Sterner many right. years ago, Tennessee versus <laughs> Arkansas. Right. And Clint Sterner, the quarterback for the Razorbacks, who had that fumble. And they're declaring it a fumble. Stevenson ball and gets the right call. So 33-yard line now for Stevenson as they go on offense after a turnover by Southwest DeKalb. Well, and that's other piece, too, in terms of you ask me, <laughs> start the second half, which side is more impressive for Stevenson, offense or defense? Well, the fumble, once again, they start, I think they've only started one drive in their half of the field. Once again, 33 yards, great starting position right now for the Jaguars. Desrick Cook gets the handoff from the new quarterback, Richard Gray, and Cook down to the 16-yard line, picks up the first down. So Richard Gray, who was the incumbent quarterback coming into the season, looked like he would be the starting quarterback, will start this second half, and that might be all for Shepard with the big game coming up against Mays next Friday night. Well, he was impressive, 125 yards pa passing in the four touchdown passes. Um, everything went right for him in the first half. So first and 10 from the 16-yard line. DuBose on the carry inside the 10-yard go, 10-yard line goes DuBose. As you mentioned at the top, we uh, Jalen Morrison Knight is out, the leading rusher for the Jaguars with that high percentage elbow last week. Uh, we saw the player go out earlier uh, in this game, and here's a replay uh, right here of the big senior bowling his way down, uh, close to another first down for the Jaguars. Yeah, they have not missed Jalen Morrison Knight one bit tonight. No. And but they will need him later. They will. And then Antonio Woods, the other player who went out with it, we saw him getting his left knee wrapped in ice. I believe it was Woods. Yeah, Antonio Woods. Yeah, had the big run, uh, the first play of scrimmage in this game. Yeah, maybe we can get a report on Woods at some point as he had suffered that left knee injury in the first half. That's a first down carry for DeBose, so first and goal to go coming up from the five-yard line. And there he is right there. So he's done for the night. Yep. Shoulder pads off. Don't see any ice on that knee. That's the both of them. That's Jalen yeah. Marson Knight sitting right next to him. Yeah. They'll need both of those guys next week against Mays. There's a lot of rushing yards this season between the two of them. Tinch on the carry gets stopped at the line of scrimmage. Mays Raiders undefeated since their state final loss to Northside Warner Robins last December at the Georgia Dome. That was a great game. Yeah, it was. Had the halftime lead on yeah. Northside Warner Robins. Yeah. Flags come out, might have some kind of unsportsmanlike penalty right here. Gary Williams, our referee. So offsetting personal fouls. Down to wash. The end of October. Pink still the prevalent color. Breast cancer right. awareness month. This, this month went by quickly. I don't know about you, Matt, but it was just September. That was I was here a month ago with you. Five weeks ago. Yep. State playoffs begin in two weeks. Next week, the final week of the regular season, we'll have the Region 6 5A championship game for you here on. GPB next Friday night. Gray rolling to his left, throwing on the run. That's caught by DeBose. Oh, boy. And DeBose just crashes into the defensive back and, as if nothing happens, scored the touchdown. Now he's just a beast. He's a, a load. Another touchdown pass, the TCSG touchdown replay as your back from quarterback Richard Gray. Nice move right here by the senior. He's right-handed, but actually puts the ball in his left hand to protect it for a moment there until he clears 
the defenders. Nice flip to his big man, classmate Darius DuBose, all 200 pounds of him, slams his way into the end zone for the sixth touchdown of this game right here for the Stevenson High School Jaguars. Tisdale, PAT. 42 to nothing. Four and a half minutes into the third quarter, and it's been all Stevenson as they get ready to play the Mays Raiders next Friday night here on GPB. At the heart of our community are the businesses that don't skip a beat. Georgia's electric membership cooperatives stand behind local commerce. Whether keeping farms running or shining a light on new ventures, we bring business, large and small, to our communities. Creating jobs, driving development, supporting dreams. Georgia's EMCs, powering our businesses, lighting the way. Miss Garner from Forest Park High School sparked an interest in me to really push me in education, uh, to be more than just a student athlete. You know, each and every day she challenged me to be a leader, a role model, and somebody positive in our community. I can never uh, thank her enough for, for, for what all she's done for me. And there are teachers just like Miss Garner all over the state of Georgia today. Welcome back to Halford Stadium, 728 for the third. Stevenson now up 42-0 on Southwest DeKalb, and we're going to kick it. We're going to go to Quad A. Last week, we showed you the dominating performance of Woodward Academy, and right now, Sandy Creek and Carrollton are going at it for the two and the three right now in that region, Region 5, Quad A. Sandy Creek leading 13-10. Carrollton right now 3-0 in region, 5-3 overall. Sandy Creek with the one loss, but Carrollton has to finish their season playing Sandy Creek this week and Woodward next week. So the Trojans have a tall order this week already down three to Sandy Creek back upstairs. All right, thank you, Nellie. Sandy Creek trying to bounce back from their worst loss since 2006 when number one ranked Woodward Academy put a whooping on the Fighting Patriots last Friday night at Colquitt Stadium right here on GPB. Yeah, my next door neighbor's son plays for Woodward and boy, they're looking forward to that game the entire season. Couldn't wait to take on Sandy Creek. And they played like it. Eastling retreating to the 14-yard line for the return. And Eastling gets dropped by Butts. That's his third special teams tackle of the night. Tavis Butts. And so Southwest DeKalb back on offense, down 42-0. I think it's safe to say Stevenson's going to win this game. So yeah. they have clinched a playoff berth for the 16th consecutive season. That's impressive. What a great job they've done. You know, Southwest DeKalb right here. I'd go right back to what your game plan was coming out of the locker room. Um, short passes, find a way just to get, you know, try to get four or five yards, positive yards every time, work for, you know, things you're going to need for next week's game. And it remains to be seen whether Southwest DeKalb will be in the hunt for a playoff berth, have movement on the left side of the offensive line for Southwest DeKalb. We already know that Miller Grove has won, so Miller Grove is going to be three and two, and Southwest DeKalb's going to be three and two. And then the uh, other game that's going to have a determining factor on the playoff region playoff structure will be the ML King game as they play Dunwoody. Let's check in with John Nelson down let's, on the sideline. Let's take a look, Matt, at the 6A poll as it currently stands here from the folks who voted on it here at GPB. And let's take a look at Colquitt County and give you some updates. Colquitt right now leading Tift 38-13, 7-44 and counting in the third. Tift had just scored to put their 13th point on the board, but Colquitt comes back just as quickly. Roswell's in a bit of a fight. They were tied at 21 at one point. There you see Grayson will come back to it in just a sec. Intercepted by Jolly. That's going to be a pick six for Sean Jolly. 48 to nothing. Well, just a miscommunication between uh, quarterback and receiver. I don't think a receiver still knows the ball was in the air. Uh, on that one. He tossed it up. It's just an ill-advised play as we check a, take a look at the TCSG touchdown replay coming up. Second interception. 
and the Jaguars now two touchdowns off those interceptions. Watch this right here. Throws the ball up. His receiver hasn't even turned around. Doesn't know the ball's on, on the way until it's already in the defender's hands. He's already running the other way towards the end zone. 32-yard pick six for Sean Jolly. And Stevenson with a runaway win tonight against their old rivals, Southwest DeKalb. And then you've got a problem again. Another penalty on Southwest DeKalb is, uh, I would say, wheels coming off, but I mean, if we're grinding axles at this point on the pavement, <laughs> unfortunately. Like I said, a young team for these Panthers, and uh, it's been a tough night for them. Speaking of young teams, Stevenson is a relatively young team themselves. Yeah. They've got 31 freshmen on their roster. That is the most that Ron Gartrell has ever had in his 20 seasons as the head coach at Stevenson. So, I mean, you look at what they're doing. This will be their eighth consecutive victory. I'm sorry, their seventh consecutive victory in their, and uh, eighth overall. Now that we got the 49th point on the board, let's go back to the 6A poll and let you see what's going on while Ron Gartrell has got the win in hand. Roswell was in a bit of a fight with 4-4 four and four Cherokee. They were tied at 21 at one point. Camden County, a lot of folks thought they were in a trap game this week, having to go to Leesburg. Right now they're only leading 14-7 against the Lee County Trojans. Archer, obviously that game postponed till tomorrow night. Peachtree Ridge, and they're playing tonight as well in Norcross and Mill Creek. The last word we had with Mill Creek and Norcross, Mill Creek 17 to nothing at the half. So we have the teams at the top of the 6A poll here with GPB. They are all still winning, but right now Norcross is the one at number 10, who's at the bottom half of a, of a losing score. So they might have some issues and drop to seven and two with one game left in their region. And that region is a fight. Yeah, they've uh, had a difficult couple of weeks there, Nelly. They were beaten badly 31 nothing by Peachtree Ridge last week and losing 17 to nothing at the half against Mill Creek this week. Uh, a loss means they're likely the number three team coming out of region seven and would be on the road at South Forsyth, if I'm not mistaken, in the first round of the state playoffs. Look at that top 10 and that graphic that John just had with some power programs in there. Petrie Ridge, McEachern, Walton, Norcross. Eastling from the 12-yard line, and Eastling dropped another great special teams tackle. Garland Dawkins making that tackle for the Jaguars. I tell you what, uh, Stevenson has been impressive in every single phase of the game. Even their kick coverage yeah. has been incredible. I believe only a couple of times Southwest DeKalb has been able to return the ball beyond the 20. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And how many times have we kind of joked about that <laughs> the, the returner gets the ball, looks up, and says uh, he's not sure where to go. He kind of shifts right, shifts left, and winds up just trying to weasel his way for a four or five yard gain because they're, they're down the field so fast. And twice on kick return, Southwest DeKalb has had to start inside their 10. Yeah. 355-66, the total yardage story. Heavy rush. Tomlin steps up, heaves it downfield, got a man open, and that's a big play for the Panthers. Inside the 35-yard line, and they finally shake a man loose. Zaki Freeman with the catch. Yeah, that was just a nice play right there because uh, the young man, Tomlin, just showed some good poise. Again, got out of the pocket but didn't get flustered. Watch him here as he feels the pressure, and that's been happening all night long. Gets out, but here he sets himself first, sees his receiver, makes the good throw, make sure his body is square, and the good throw to the receiver, positive yards, and hey, they're in Stevenson territory, first time since Tuesday. 42-yard reception. Flags down, likely a hold coming up here against Southwest DeKalb. Pass was thrown complete to Cody and driven out of bounds at the 29, but again, a flag down. Yeah, it's going to come back, but that's the thing right there, the play you can't do is to have that kind of, you know, and he'll learn this with maturity, and the coaches will work with him on this, but you can't run to your receiver and then toss and put him in dangerous way where he's going to get a three. Or that's just, you know, try to go downfield with it, but he'll learn that with maturity. Only a sophomore. He's had such a great season for the Panthers. A lot of learning 
important moments tonight. Well you saw prior to that 42 yard catch and run and the penalty is indeed against Southwest DeKalb. They had only 66 yards of total offense in this game and this is a team that averages 399 a game. So Stevenson has smothered Southwest DeKalb. And then some. First and 25 following the penalty. Tomlin on the run and will run. First time tonight he's tucked and run. And he's out of bounds at the 38 yard line and picks up 11 on the play. Well, here's another defense, another uh, change. One reason why Southwest DeKalb is able to do a little more in offense in this series, you don't see the big guns up front for Stevenson. Aaron Sterling, he have now 18 sacks in the season. Season is not in the game. Amari Andrews not in the game. Nigel Grant at the moment not in the game. Yeah, at this point, you get those guys on the sideline. You don't want anybody to get hurt. Yeah, well, you've got a, yeah, you got a region championship game against undefeated and second-ranked Mays next week. Yeah. They whip the ball out there to Cody. Cody trying to get around the edge, gets by Butts, and steps out of bounds after picking up the first down at the 24. Yeah, Andrews was in, but yeah, but it's a, a different personnel, no question about it, for the Jaguars on defense. So first and 10 from the 24 yard line. Stevenson trying to throw a fifth shutout during the seven game winning streak. Southwest DeKalb trying to prevent them here. And incomplete. Led Freeman a little bit too much on that route. And while the score on the field has been a little bit lopsided, the drumline score is a battle to the end. Pretty impressive. Your point, Matt, Southwest to Cavs band still hasn't sat down. Run by Tomlin. And Tomlin sidesteps a tackle and picks up the first down at the nine yard line. And that hasn't been there all night. But again, you've got no Aaron Sterling chasing you down from behind either, so that makes uh, a bit of a difference. <laughs> exactly. You're not running your offense against three D1 prospects. Yeah. yeah. Stevenson has taken those guys out of the lineup. And that's on the defensive line alone, those D1 prospects. Right. Final minute of the third quarter. And oh. broken up, nearly intercepted. That was Miles Hanna, the safety, who was trying to get himself his own pick six. One more look. Again, he threw that ball flat-footed, no zip on it whatsoever, and that's why the defender is able to come in and almost make an interception. Tomlin's got to be able to, in that situation, get that ball out cleanly, effectively, quickly. But that soft toss, flat-footed, almost cost him an interception and maybe, maybe more. We'll see if they squeeze in one more play here before the third quarter ends. And they won't. The third quarter comes to an end, much like the first two quarters had ended. Stevenson dominating. Two more touchdowns for the Jaguars in the third quarter. The five-yard toss from Gray to Bowles. And then Jolly had a pick six. It's 49 to nothing. Questions? Can't wait until morning. 
So I'm one of many nurses at Cigna with answers, anytime, day or night. I'm Lauren, and I've got your back. Game day brings out the best in all of us. At Regions, every day is game day. The annual Lights, Lights celebration kicks off the holiday season in historic downtown Moultrie, Thanksgiving night, November 26th at 6 p.m. Brought to you by City of Moultrie Main Street Program and Downtown Moultrie Association. DowntownMoultrie.com Here, beauty is a lot more than skin deep. For more than 100 years, we have focused on creating individual success stories. This is a place where professors are mentors, competition is cheered, collaboration counts, experience is hands-on, and connections are lifelong. VSU, over 100 majors, championship athletics, focused on your success. She's perfectly healthy. Cigna covers preventive care. That's having your back. Welcome back. Halford Stadium getting ready for the final 12 minutes. Stevenson leading Southwest to Cab by the score of 49-0. Let's kick it down to South Georgia and Swamp War. The 54th renewal. You see the time on the clock. Clinch leading 14-7 with under a minute to go in Homerville. This is Adam Bell and Charlton Sportsnet helping us out with this. Two of the top 10 teams right now in single A going at it. Five teams from this region will probably make the single A public 16 field. And this game is always a classic. This one no different. 14-7, under a minute to go back upstairs. All right, thank you, John Nelson, Matt Stewart, and Larry Smith with you upstairs, along with the GPB Army tonight here in Clarkston. Another football Friday in Georgia, the next to last of the regular season here in the state as we start it. First play of the fourth quarter, ball thrown to the end zone, oh. and flag comes out on the play. Cody, the intended target, looks like Carlito Gonzalez going to be flagged for the interference. Now a final clinch has won 14 to 7. Southwest the cab now for this penalty. Best chance they've had all night to get into the end zone. The night that's getting chillier as we welcome in November. Southwest DeKalb hoping to make the state playoffs for the first time since Buck Godfrey was the head coach. Of course, the legendary Buck Godfrey and Ron Gartrell, longtime rivals in this county. Way back. Gartrell now with 202 victories tonight will be 203 for his career. Godfrey won 273 games in 30 seasons as the Panthers head coach, including the 1995 state championship. Also a finalist in 1990 and five-time semi-finalist. Nothing doing. Man, that defense is so darn fast. No chance for Francisco Hunter to even hit the hole. No. And Stevenson playing like they want a shot out here. They're not giving anything up. You see that it's like they've got to give up some yards and some plays, and it's like, wait a minute, guys, they're inside the 10. Watch the speed here, guys. 
in the backfield. He didn't have a chance, as you said. Jethro George is the linebacker. It would help if you blocked him. Nobody put a helmet oh, yeah. on the guy. Yeah, that's, that's in a In all honesty, I'm compelled to be honest on that. No one blocked the guy. <laughs> I mean, you can be fast if nobody hits you. Sure. And look third like a star. Yeah. yeah, third down and goal. <laughs> Got a block. One of the key elements of the game. Pass oh. is thrown incomplete in the end zone, looking there for Cody, and it's going to be fourth down. And the crack at it here. With the running clock, you may not get this chance again, but I like the, the move that Tomlin put on. This is a nice move right here. Turns the opposite way. That's tough to kind of set yourself to turning the other way that you should. That's an unnatural turn, a pivot right there. Couldn't quite complete the pass. So fourth down and goal from the eight yard line. Stevenson, defensive coordinator Donald Sellers, been a long time right hand man for Ron Gartrell. His unit trying to preserve the shutout here early in the fourth quarter. Um, yeah, I think it was a bad snap that the offensive lineman might have picked up. Cobb, Jalen Cobb, I think 58, Jalen yeah. Cobb picked up the snap and then tried to shot put it back to the quarterback. Yeah. It was hard to tell what happened, but there's a penalty on it. I'll take a look at it here. I hear this right here. Now yeah, watch the, this. Yeah, he yeah. just bobbled the ball. He never snaps the ball. No, yeah. And then he's like, oh, here. You want this? Here, <laughs> you take it. I don't want it. <laughs> Luckily, the play was already blown dead. Five yard false start penalty since the ball never snapped. Now that's the, that's the helmet of a center right there. There you go. Look at Jalen. I mean, that's like, you know, you know, have you ever seen those whales? I mean, they got scars all right. over them and taking harpoons <laughs> all their life and just battling it off. Yeah, that looks like his helmet right yeah, there. Yeah, that's true been harpooned a lot. He has tonight. Fourth and goal from the 13. And that's going to be an incomplete and a flag out too. Tried to pump fake and the ball went right into the ground. Yeah. Justin Tomlin again, just a sophomore. You got a feel for him. He's kind of, you, you, you can just, you know, read the look on his face. Holding call, which will be declined. He's like, can this game be over exactly. already? <laughs> it's a lonely feeling out there, but he'll have a lot better nights. He'll, he'll take this and learn from it. Two more years to play. It's young Southwest to cap team. Now get ready to dig in deep on the depth chart here. We might be seeing some JV players here yeah. with a 49 to nothing lead, but we'll take a break first, come back for the final eight minutes when we get back. Where do you come alive? A stadium, lecture hall, a music hall, church potluck? This year, you have a new spot, walkgeorgia.org, a free website that provides you with all the resources needed to get your heart rate up and body out in your community. Sign up and receive individual or group fitness tracking, fitness demos by certified trainers, recipes, and a guide to resources in your Georgia county, all in one easy-to-use site. When you move more, you live more. walkgeorgia.org. Your local Alpha agents are proud to join viewers like you in making this programming possible. We're local agents in the community. We're part of the community. I love doing business in the town that I live in. My clients are my friends. They can just step in my office and say hello. That's very important to me. We want to be available to them in case they need us. You get a lot of reward personally going home at night knowing that you've taken care of folks. Protecting our communities, neighbor to neighbor, for almost 70 years. Alpha Insurance. Welcome back, Hofford Stadium, 8.20 to go in the fourth. Stevenson leading Southwest DeKalb 49-0, but let's go to Region 2-6A with a win tonight. Lovejoy could clinch the number one seed, but Tucker's not having anything of it. 
Early third quarter, Tucker is leading Lovejoy 21 to 14 at Adams Stadium with a win. Tucker goes to three and one. Lovejoy goes to three and one. Tucker goes to six and three. Lovejoy would actually go to four and five. So this would go a long way to get Tucker either a two seed or a three seed possibly even a look outside at the top seat out of Region 2, keeping Lovejoy from clinching. They're having a good time. So are we back upstairs. Battle of the bands continues, <laughs> even though the battle on the football field might be lopsided. Man, these guys are going at each other, across from each other. Right now it's Stevenson's turn. And they go back on offense first and 10 from their 12-yard line. Tinch on the carry, gets dropped. In his tracks, nothing doing right there. Tackle was made by Hunter. Another score to update, uh, NL King leading Dunwoody 15 to 12. That's in the second quarter. You can check out that score on the GPB football app. But that would throw the playoff picture, the region playoff picture that is next week into disarray because Southwest DeKalb's gonna drop to three and two. Miller Grove has improved to three and two. And ML King would also be three and two. So out of those three teams, two of them will play for a shot at a state playoff berth, but the other one's gonna get left out. So they'll have to sort through the tiebreakers there in Region 6, Division A, to figure that out. We know that Stevenson's going to be the division winner and play the Division B winner, Mays, right here on GPB next Friday night at Lakewood Stadium. So Anthony third goal. Wolf. I'm sorry, Anthony Wolf at last carry there, Matt. He said brings up third down and six. Tinch on the carry. First down and more. Tinch breaks a tackle. Now it's a foot race. Tinch with a stiff arm. They can't get him on the ground. And Tinch finally out of bounds at the 22 yard line. My math is right. 61 yard gain on this is the replay. Watch this. You just talked about. Here's Tinch. Only a couple of carries in the game, but he gets around the the end very quickly and off to the races. And watch the stiff arm. He gains another 20 yards just fighting with the defender at number 16. Ja'Cory Harden. Ja'Cory Harden, yeah. <laughs> watch Ja'Cory Harden trying to tackle his elbow. <laughs> Not having much success in doing that. And there's a flag down at the end of the play, too, a personal foul, face mask, and it's going against Stevenson. Well, on that play right there, I think they got him. Uh, Ten Jackson reaching in and grabbing the face mask there toward the end of the play. And they'll do that from the spot, so they're going to move that ball all the way back to the 48. The 48, yeah. Yep. As long as it happened, oh gosh, you know, he still got another 10 yards after all of that. But what a luxury, embarrassment of riches for Ron Gartrell at <laughs> running back. You've got your 900 yard rusher, Jalen Marson Knight, out with a hyperextended elbow, and you've had. A 43-yard run from Antonio Woods. He since was hurt. Kinsler had an 86-yard touchdown run. And then Tinch just had a 63-yard run. DeBose on the carry right there. He's got a touchdown catch. Actually, that's not DeBose. Anthony Wills. Yeah, Anthony Wills in there getting his second yeah. carry. Joysha Gay is the female side judge tonight. Part of the officiating crew working tonight's ball game with Gary Wills, our referee. Here we go again. Here we go again. That's going to be down inside the five, yeah. out at the one yard yeah. line. Big right run call. by Javon Hilton. Yeah, that's the right call. His knee was down at the one before the ball crossed the plane. One more look at it, but once again, just the big blocking and the speed. Who would, this guy's what, number five, six in the depth chart? Uh, uh, he's not on the depth chart. Okay, there you go. Not right. on our depth chart. Exactly, and he comes in, 5'9", uh, 170 junior, and he runs that ball just like he was the starter 
Looks a lot like Woods in the opening play from midfield, the first play from scrimmage we had in the game. Same exact play, he runs it the same way. Yeah. And they're now calling it a, they calling it a touchdown? Lining up for, for an extra point. Uh, no, I, I think they just, Yeah, they hadn't even added the score. Now that was not a touchdown. Yeah, there's yeah the now score they, added. they've added the score, but uh, that was not a touchdown. And okay, well, let's take a look back at it. They they never signaled touchdown no. on the field, but let's take a look at it right here as we take a look at our TCSG touchdown replay. He's out of bounds right there, back at the three. Yeah. So close enough though when it's 55 to nothing. Football Fridays in Georgia on GPB is made possible in part by Regions Bank. It's time to expect more. Georgia's Electric Membership Corporation, lighting the way. Technical College System of Georgia, learn more, earn more. Cigna, together all the way. And viewers like you, thank you. What is by moonlight and empty field is by the magic of electricity Sacred Ground. As the official energy provider of the GHSA, Georgia's electric membership cooperatives proudly support our student athletes. We are there, illuminating the glory moments fans just have to see. Capturing the hustle, elevating champions, sharing the win. Georgia's EMCs, empowering our youth, lighting the way. Today, companies in the aerospace, advanced manufacturing, and film industries need skilled workers, and the earning potential is high. Go Build Georgia can show you where the jobs are and what skills you need to get them. And the Technical College System of Georgia has fast, affordable training for these great paying careers. Build your blueprint for success at GoBuildGeorgia.com and look to the Technical College System of Georgia to put your plan into action. As a strong, stable bank, Regions is always looking for opportunities to boost the vitality of our communities. In addition to offering financial solutions for our customers, we are committed to supporting local initiatives and organizations that help our neighborhoods thrive. Regions is proud to be a partner with GPB in building a better Georgia. The annual Lights, Lights celebration kicks off the holiday season in historic downtown Moultrie, Thanksgiving night, November 26th at 6 p.m. Brought to you by City of Moultrie Main Street Program and Downtown Moultrie Association. DowntownMoultrie.com. 5.43 to play, 55 nothing now, Stevenson. Let's take a look back at that uh, touchdown here by Javon Hilton. 28-yard touchdown run. On further review, they probably would not have counted this in college or the NFL. Yeah, but no replay here. But watch that left shoulder drop down just inside the one before the ball crosses. He's clearly down before the ball crosses uh, the plane. It would be in for a touchdown. But NBA, that's a continuation touchdown. Sure. That's <laughs> exactly. That still counts. And as you said, when the score is 55 nothing, Who cares? OK. Yeah. But you're 5 uh, 43, Matt, away from another shutout during this seven, what's about to be a seven game win streak. Eight play, 88 yard drive. Hilton cares. We said, who cares? Hit Jaden. He cares. Young man gets a touchdown. Eastling has been perpetually returning kickoffs tonight. Gets to the 36-yard line, flag out. Let's check in with John Nelson. Time to kick it. We're gonna go to region 6-6A for the log jam with team seven and six. It's Northview and Alpharetta right now. They're both three and four, four and four in the region. Northview leading Alpharetta by the score of 28 to 14. This puts the winner, whoever it is, back in the fray for that fourth playoff spot coming out of region 6-6A. So this could be a big one if Northview hangs on. Down in region one, huge touchdown for Tift. It's now 38-26, 10 minutes to go in the game. Colquitt still leading there. Camden County leading Lee County 17-13. And that looks like a big offensive play there as Northview is driving from left to right. So action in 1-6A. We'll have a lot more as we go. And then the postgame show as well back upstairs. All right, looking forward to it as we also look ahead to next Friday night. In our regular season finale, going to decide the Region 6 5A championship as these 
fifth ranked Stevenson Jaguars fresh off an impressive 55 to nothing demolishing here of Southwest DeKalb will take on Mays for the region championship and this has to be um, this has to be the biggest route in the in the history of this rivalry the 13th all time meeting all of them relatively close nothing close to anything like this as Stevenson has just waylaid the Panthers tonight. Tomlin running and steps out of bounds at the 31 yard line. Tough night for him as we mentioned. But I like the poise he's showing stepping up again. Some of the starters out of the game now for Stevenson but I like what he did right there stepped up kept his head looking up looking at his receivers managed to move forward for a few positive yards. Second down and six. Tomlin steps up, fires, and dropped at the 42 yard line. Dropped by Matthew Ray. It was interesting. We saw the kicking it highlight with John Nelson there, and Alpharetta losing had an interesting little piece in the Georgia High School Football Daily email this week. Uh, Max Preps, at the beginning of the season, they rate every team's chances of making the playoffs. Alpharetta, according to Max Preps, had a 99.6% chance of making the playoffs this year, almost a 100% chance to make the playoffs according to their computer rankings, and it looks like they're going to miss out wow. this year. Wow. Third down and six. Ball batted as it was thrown. And Tomlin ends up on his back. Pressure coming right there that time from Keyshawn Jackson back down to Nelly. And we mentioned the score, so let's show you the proof. Back to the hog pen, 38-26, under 10 minutes to go in regulation. And I'm using that because Tift has put up a lot of points. They were down 30-13 at one point. You see a big defensive play there by the Packers at Mack Tharp Stadium. The way that this would shake out, Colquitt, if they win, 4-0, 9-0. Camden right now leading 17-13 in Leesburg. That would be 4-0, 9-0. Camden and Colquitt next week would be for the region title. Tiff would go to 0-4, and, and that would pretty much take them out of any shot at the four seed. Wintersville right now and Lee County, those three squads would be at 1-3, one, one of them at 2-2. Two and two. So the three and the four seed right now in Region 1 will be in play. And the Wintersville Classic is going to dictate it next week with Tift County and Lowndes. That's probably going to solidify the three and the four out of Region 1. There will be a test later on back upstairs. And the Stevenson defense gets the ball back at the 19-yard line. And a flag came out as well on the play. Yeah, the flag is way back here at the 35-yard line, it was, and it was after the play. So I'm not sure if there was some kind of uh, holding somewhere that was up near the line of scrimmage he saw from his vantage point or her vantage point or um, not sure what happened to it. It's, it is 20 yards away. One more look at this, another blocked kit. Again, just the defense of Stevenson. This time he gets in there and blocks. He doesn't go against off his, uh, his teammates, Miles Hanna with yep. the block. And, and the penalty is against Southwest DeKalb, so adding injury to insult right there to the block kick the mm -hmm. second block kick of the night mm -hmm. and first and goal to go for the Jaguars at the nine and a half yard line. Valdosta has a 17 seven lead. Three minutes to play in the third quarter in the Wintersville Classic that game is huge. There's a high likelihood that the loser of that game or one of those two teams, Lowndes or Valdosta, are not even going to make the playoffs. And so Stevenson, with two minutes to play, goes into their victory formation. And this is, uh, this is a nice little gesture here by 
Ron Gartrell to say enough is enough. They certainly could punch it in from the nine yard line. Yeah. And this, you know, you don't usually see teams take a victory formation with two plus minutes. Right, right. So. Yeah, but that is a class act. Two coaches in this game a long time, a lot of mutual respect. He, like you said, he very easily could have taken, he said, some freshman off the bench who hasn't seen playing time in this entire year and behind this line makes something happen. Every other running back that's touched the ball for Stevenson has turned it into gold. Well, really excited. Next Friday night, we've got the Region 6 5A championship for you here on GPB as the fifth ranked Stevenson Jaguars with their seven game winning streak and eight and one record will take on the nine and zero oh and second ranked state semifinalist Bays Raiders. What a matchup we have for you next Friday night on GPB for the Region 5, Region 6 5A championship and a number one seed in the state playoffs. Really looking forward to that one. And uh, man, that's a toss up game. Uh, I don't know, Mays looks really good. This Stevenson team is as impressive as I've seen uh, in the past uh, two or three years in terms of what they do on both sides of the ball. Yeah, a lot of people wrote them off after they got beat by American Heritage out of Plantation, Florida, not really recognizing just how good American Heritage is and also not recognizing just how young Stevenson and inexperienced Stevenson was at the start of this season. But they have parlayed that loss to American Heritage on this field now into a seven game winning streak with five shutouts during that seven game winning streak and having surrendered only 25 points mm -hmm. during that seven game winning streak. And now for the final snap of the game. What a performance for the Jaguars. Most lopsided victory ever in the history of this rivalry for Stevenson. The Jaguars throttle their cross county rival Southwest DeKalb Panthers by a final score of 55 to nothing. Ron Gartrell records his 203rd victory in his 169th at Stevenson. Jags now 8-1. They win the Division A championship at 5-0. And, oh. and get ready for the Mays Raiders. Good Larry Smith, them. I'm Press Matt Stewart. We're done up here, buddy. Yep. You can go hop in your car. Head on home. And we're going to send it down to John Nelson. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt, here with the coach. You know now that you got Mays next week. And I know it's going to be another tough game after this one, but you had a great performance out there tonight. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't want y'all to bring up Mays tonight, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough game, hopefully. We got to go over there and play at their place. Um, you know, they're undefeated and highly ranked team with great athletes and great coaches. So we're just going to try to prepare the best we can and see what happens. What did you learn about your team tonight? Um, that they want to compete and they've been competing all year and they got up for this game we didn't play that well last week so they, they've been resilient and uh, bounced back and uh, played the type of football game we wanted them to play and I guess from that standpoint what have you learned about your squad since the loss to American Heritage where you haven't lost to a team in the state of Georgia this year well you know, we found out a lot, and the kids are growing up. We felt like we had a good team from the beginning, and just making sure that we put everything in the right places and look like the pieces are starting to fall together. All right, well, thanks for your time tonight, and thanks for being a great uh, part of Football Fridays with us. Thank you very much. Ron Gartrell, head coach of Stevenson. Big win tonight. We'll see them again next week. Post game show officially starts right now. Thank you, John, and welcome to the GPB Football Fridays in Georgia post-game show. I'm Mark Carmen. We have a terrific show coming your way. We've got scores. We've got highlights. We've got interviews. We've got bands. We've got all kinds of things. I know. I feel like we're getting real close and personal with Ron Gartrell. We'll see him again <laughs> the third time this season next week. So a lot to get to. Right. Well, let's check out right off the bat some of the highlights from tonight's game as Stevenson took charge of this one and took charge early. First quarter, it is their quarterback. Xavier Shepard finding Hazan Littles open. He goes into the end zone to make the score 14 to nothing. Then, second quarter, Xavier Shepard to Khalil Denton. Newton. Newton with the touchdown in the corner, number 16. This makes it 21 to nothing. Still in the second quarter, 
Xavier Shepard to Khalil Newton again, rolling out, finding him, breaking tackles, streaking down the sidelines, 50 yards to make it 28 to nothing. And then it's Xavier Shepard one more time to Hassan Littles to make it 35 to zip. And Stevenson goes on to win this game on five touchdown passes by the quarterback, 55 to nothing. Your final score. And here, the lights may have dimmed. I'm not quite sure. And it's the, spooky. And, and it's Halloween. I know. The gremlins are out. It's great. It's wonderful. It's GPB. I know. We've got all our friends. The pumpkins are standing behind us. Right. You it's carved nice. one of those, I, I think, did. back there. I did. I carved one. I carved a football one, but it didn't it, it didn't handle the cold so well. So. Right. And Lauren <laughs> Anderson and her mom and a lot of people got involved I know. In that. Really creative team members behind. I mean, I, I picked the simplest sketch possible. And that happened to be a football, so I was able to contribute a little bit, but a really creative team to put those together for right. us Right, well, we thank them, and they did an outstanding job. And now let's check in with John Nelson. I think he's got a player or two alongside. John, take her away. Or 38 of them here with Shep. Okay, be nice. I have terrible towels here. We got a lot of Stevenson Jaguars. They've been a great part of Football Fridays with it this year. All right, Shep, let's talk about this week and what was – the, you know, Coach has said that this is a competitive series. It's not necessarily a rivalry, but what was it like working this week, getting ready for this game? Uh, well, we just worked hard, you know. We had to take advantage of the thing that they gave us. And when you did that, I know obviously things were kind of floating and flying out there. When your offense is rolling the way that it is, multiple targets, multiple guys, everything's flying out there. What's it like? Describe it for me, what it's like to when this thing is floating out there. It's the best feeling in the world. We just want to keep it going. So then how do you do that? To keep up the uh, momentum. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. How do you keep up the momentum? <laughs> that woke you up. How do you keep up the momentum? I know you got Mays next week, and I know that, you know, when asking Coach about that, it's probably a little early to talk about Mays, but with Mays, you got Mays next week over at Lakewood. What do you think the week, the work week is going to be like for y'all? Oh, we're going to work real hard. We're going to try to open some more, some more things because we know they're out there watching and stuff. Okay, so you lose to American Heritage. I know that you guys can plug your ears that saying that you lost to American Heritage. What have you learned about yourselves since that loss to that Florida team here on this field? Oh, we just stayed together and didn't get down. You know, just kept everything going. We know that's a pretty good team, but we'll be all right. And you are going to be all right. Shep, we're going to catch up with all y'all next week. Thanks for hanging out, and thanks for making, making sure I have an exit path. Let's send it over to Jackie. Post game show continues. Thank you, John. <laughs> they are hyped up. They have all the reason to be. Great win for them here tonight. Okay, guys, don't forget that you can interact with us on all social media platforms if you search GPB Sports on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. But also, we have an app. If you go to the App Store, type in GPB Sports. It's completely free. If you consider yourself a high school football fan in the state of Georgia, this is the app for you. It gives you up-to-the-date scores from around the state. And if you look here, you can also stream the game live live wherever we are. If you click on this green GPB HD tab here, and my fingers are really cold, so it might not be working. <laughs> I promise it works. And then you can stream the game live the entire time. There we go. Watch the game live. And you can watch it from wherever you are. So we are not old school anymore. GPB is not just for TV, but you can watch it on your phone or your iPad, anything else. So connect with us on all of those platforms. Now let's get to the play of the game for this one. Of course, it had to be Stevenson. There were several to choose from, but for me, it was the very first play of the game at the end of the first quarter. Sneaky handoff there to Tristan Kinsland by his quarterback. Great blocking by the offensive line, and away he goes. No defender able to touch him. He explodes down the sideline, sails into the end zone to give Stevenson their first score of the night. And that really set the tone for how the game will go. So number 17 goes to Tristan Kensland for the GPB play of the game. Time now to check out some scores from around the state on the Georgia EMC scoreboard. And first off, we're going down to the region of doom, region one, 6A. Some big ball games being played down there. You've got Colquitt County leading Tift County, 38 to 13 in the third quarter. You've got Camden County also unbeaten, taking on Lee County, 17-13, that game in the fourth quarter. Grayson is unbeaten, looking like it will remain, so 43 to 10 in the third over Brookwell. Wood Roswell also unbeaten so far this year, leads Cherokee 35-21 in the fourth. Mill Creek unbeaten, leading Norcross 17 to nothing that game 
at halftime. We've got Mays over Tri-Cities, 41-7 in the third. We will see Mays next week here on Football Fridays in Georgia. Top-ranked Cartersville, no trouble tonight, winning 49 to nothing. It is GAC over Lovett, 34 to nothing in the fourth. McEachern leads Harrison, 19 to zip at the half. And in the Wintersville Classic, we have Valdosta leading Lounge by a score of 17 to nothing. And we now welcome in Phil Proctor, the co-host of Georgia Traveler what and all is. things awesome. Yeah. Phil, excited to see you again for our post-game show. And you've got some zombie stuff to talk to us about this week. Well, you know, the thing about it is Georgia has become a hotbed for film and television. So my co-host, Ashley Mingwasser, headed on down on the south side to find out what's going on with zombies of The Walking Dead. Ooh. You've heard the term Hollywood South, but I think it goes by a much more original name, Georgia. Our great state holds its own as a choice location for the TV and film industry, and well, there are a couple of diehard fans who won't let the country forget that. I'm Carrie Sagal Burns. I am the chief movie buff. I'm Patty Davis. I'm the head television fanatic, and we, we are, are Atlanta, Atlanta Movie, movie Tours. Tours. I was giving tours around my neighborhood, which is Castleberry Hill in downtown Atlanta, and Patty invited me to the opening of a restaurant. We started talking, and she said we should do this as a business, and we did. Running every weekend with Big Zombie Tours 1 and 2, a general Atlanta film sites tour, and their newest, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind tour, these two movie mavens know Georgia locations like the blood in their veins. All of this is, is, you know, public information that we like to take people to. We don't go to live film sets. So that's one of the big keys, is that unless it happens accidentally. Here, this is Terminus. Here it is. Feast your eyes. Oh, we got security down there. Bad boys, bad boys, people, what you gonna do? Here's the very rail car where all of our characters were captured, spoiler alert, if you haven't caught up with the season, <laughs> and held hostage here. And this is the way season four concluded. I love Atlanta. <laughs> You're gonna be able to step into it the sets of your favorite characters and be right where they were when they were filming all those amazing scenes. For me, the choice was clear. I wanted to relive The Walking Dead, AMC television smash hit with an international following, all based on the comic book by the same name. To go where hundreds of living, rotting corpses had gone before me. To gaze with my own eyes upon the Georgia structures that defended Rick Grimes, Daryl Dixon, and the rest of the cast, I needed to experience Big Zombie Tour, part two. Welcome to Woodbury. We're in Woodbury. The Woodbury right now. It's actually Sinoy, Georgia. Looks just like the show, The Walking Dead. Amazing, I have chills. And there it is the official Walking Dead store. Tour goers meet at the Woodbury shop in downtown Sonoy, stocked floor to ceiling with bloodied gags and zombie merch galore, a doomsday prepper's paradise. Walking Dead coasters, everyone should have a set. Everyone makes fun of a redneck until the zombie apocalypse. It's a true statement. What do you even put in a zombie survival bag? Have I learned nothing from the show? Can't take your hair dryer. I know that much. Mrs. Gerald Dixon. Here's to hoping. Let's get on this bus. <laughs> Once you've had your fill of thrills, it's all aboard the AMT bus for a three hour excursion of Coweta County, home to the everyday locations featured in The Walking Dead seasons two through four. Show clips set the scene for locations that, with a little bit of background from your tour guide incognito, come alive before you. The only things you won't see aboard this bus are zombies, walkers, biters, skin eaters, geeks, rotters. Actors on the show refer to the undead as pretty much anything creative except the Z word. Herschel's farm, a private residence, and of course, the prison, a studio setting. And what you will see looks eerily familiar. Please, ladies and gentlemen, try to contain yourselves. Exclusive access, here we go. Oh, I know what it is. We're about to find out what this is, but I already know. I think it's the zombie arena. Later during Big Zombie Tour 2, there's a pit stop in downtown Noonan for coffee and snacks. The last thing you want to say on a tour bus full of zombie fans is that you're hungry. You know what I'm saying? This, the site of yet another iconic zombie apocalypse tale, Zombieland. While some guests refueled, the rest of us learned how to walk like the walking dead. We got your meal because you got to have a, a 
goal to achieve. Having emerged scrape, scratch, and bite free at the conclusion of the full tour, mum's the word to preserve the magic, it was time to corner our mysterious tour guide. Well, I'm here to pick your brain on everything you might know, not to eat your brain, just okay. to pick it. That's fine. Yeah, I'm no we'll threat We'll have a mutual all. agreement there. I won't eat you if you won't eat me. Agree, let's shake on that. Awesome. So who's your favorite character on The Walking Dead? Uh, I would be Rick by far. Rick's your favorite character? Absolutely. No one ever says that. I know. What do you think my absolute favorite on the show is? Uh, yours? Yeah, it's, I a, would, it's a pair of people. If that... I would guess uh, Glenn and Maggie. Yes, yes. Uh, am I that transparent? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only couple. <laughs> That's true, I gave myself away there. Well, there's a reason we can't see your face today, Michael. So That's I've, correct. I've, ke I've kept you the shrouded man. Um, so can you tell me, a mystery why we can't see your face why we can't show our audience your face today uh, because I may or may not be an actor and I may or may not work on certain productions that uh, people may be interested in are affiliated with the show we're <laughs> scouting today from a location standpoint so what you're telling me Michael is you never really know who might be a zombie Okay, I'm good. Yeah. I don't think I need to see any more of that. I didn't want to have nightmares tonight, guys, but now I will. But it's Halloween Eve. It's a good oh, night God. to have. We're gonna have nightmares. I get away. <laughs> what I want to know is, are y'all walking zombie fans? You know, do y'all uh, like the, the Walking, walking Dead? dead? No, I am you, not. You, I what? love that it's in Atlanta, but yeah. I, I do not have the stomach to sit through the Walking Dead. I really don't. I'm weak. What about you, Mark? Well, you know, if they had to eat my brains, they might starve to death, you know? <laughs> see, I feel the same way, because there's not much up here. Y'all see my hair gone, so that's just the only thing holding my brains in, man. All right, well, let's kick it to John Nelson, who's going to kick it around Georgia for us, John. All right, let's go to the region of doom while we are being serenaded by the Southwest Decad Band. Nothing like a little mood music for the highlights. Let's go to region one and let you know what's going on in region one, six, eight, and let's head back to the hog pen. Under five minutes to go regulation. Baby Lou Martinez with a field goal to make the margin 15. It's 41-26 right now. Coquit leading Tiff. Tiff will end up, if this score holds, being winless in the region heading into the last week of the season. Also, you have Camden beating Lee. So, once again, if these two margins hold, Camden and Coquit next week will end up playing for the region title and a lot of home games. And uh, you want home games at Gilman? That is pack a lunch, pack a dinner, and make sure that you've got everything squared away when you're going to Kingsland. Also, update, five minutes and counting in the third at the Wintersville Classic. The last update we had there, 17-7. Valdosta scored, then Lowndes scored off a kick return. We like saying ensuing kickoffs for a reason. So. Five minutes left in the third. Last update we had, Wintersville Classic. Valdosta leading Lounge, 17-7. We'll have more scores as we go. Let's send it back over to the set. You know, we are just down in Moultrie a couple of weeks ago, and there was 11,000 fans there, and that place is packed again tonight. I know. Yeah, I know. That Colquitt County, man, they just they do it every time. All right. Well, coming up on our GPB Football Fridays in Georgia postgame show, we'll have more scores from around the state, and we'll check in with social media once more. Also, we will take you behind the scenes for more zombie action, a little makeup tutorial, but that's only the beginning of what we've got in store for our post-game show. It's all coming up next on the GPB Football Fridays in Georgia. Stay with us. Meet John. John has decided to drop out of school, but what he didn't realize is that now this door will be closed to him, and this one this one too. Well, you get the idea. to your team like never before with the GPB Sports Football app. Get the latest news. Watch featured games live wherever you Sammy are. Williams finds a hole. 
Look at that, look at that. Find relevant info on schools and take interactive 3D tours of stadiums around the state. Tweet game highlights from the stands and get up to the minute scores all Friday night. The gridiron has gone digital. Download the free GPB Sports Football app from the iTunes App Store now. During this performance, one student will drop out of high school. Be there for your big finish. Welcome back to the GPB post game show. We are at uh, Hallford Stadium where Stephen is, Stevenson has just defeated Southwest Escab by a score of 55 to nothing. Next week we're heading to Lakewood Stadium where uh, Stevenson will play Mays High School. So we now welcome in Phil Proctor for a, uh, another segment. And you got, and I are such handsome lads that we don't need makeup, but. You know, a beautiful young lady like Ashley Menwasher, she might need some makeup now and then. Well, you know, John Nelson says totally different from what you just said, <laughs> but that's okay. You know, Ashley is one of those folks that really likes to dive deep when she goes in to try to figure something out. So what does it take to get all the characters ready for The Walking Dead? Let's check out zombie makeup. Ooh. <laughs> Thanks to Atlanta Movie Tours, I'm getting a special opportunity to be transformed into a zombie. What everyone wishes they could be as fans of The Walking Dead, right? So without further ado... We're going to turn you into a disgusting, nasty, horrifying zombie today. Sounds fantastic, zombie makeup artist. All right, well, let's do it. I'm ready. All right. Contacts. Yes, the fun part. Describe, these are interesting looking. They're mesh. I don't know if the camera can see, they're mesh. You ever been airbrushed before? Yes. Okay. Normally it's human skin tone. Yeah, this is not so much this time. You wouldn't be a zombie without some blood. Oh, that, yeah, that's right. That's what that is? I can't even tell. Let me get really close. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like jelly, actually, but it doesn't taste very good, so. It's called teeth stain, and you're going to hate me forever because of using this. More blood. Now it's time to go and torment some of the townspeople. Let's go do it. <laughs> Looked like she was ready to go eat some brains. Ashley, you're my hero. <laughs> Way to go, girl. <laughs> I don't think I would have done that. I have enough problems putting my contacts in. They put those little oh, things in. Oh, that looked bad, hard to do. Ooh. I couldn't put those no, kind of no, contacts I mean, in. But, uh, no, great piece, Ashley. That was great. And uh, you really should go try that out. I mm -hmm. think that makeup thing would work for you. Well, it couldn't hurt. <laughs> couldn't I'm, hurt. I'm leaving that alone. He said it, not me. Well, let's check in with Jackie. <laughs> She's standing by with the director yeah, of the Stevenson the High School out. Marching Band. Jackie. All right. Thank you. Yeah, this is Quentin Goins, uh, Stevenson High School Marching Band director. And you guys have had a lot going on. Did you see what I did there? Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> we had a lot going on. Uh, the band has traveled to Florida and Mississippi over the last two weeks. Uh, they participated in homecomings at Florida a &M University and Jackson State University, and uh, they've been well received at many parades. Um, we also participated in the DeKalb Marching Festival about three weeks ago where the students received superiors in performance, and uh, we're looking for a wonderful year. It's been good. The football team is doing great. The band is doing great, and uh, we're looking forward to what next week is going to bring with Mays High School. Absolutely. You guys have been putting on quite a show, too, not just here in the stadium but out back to competing against each other do you guys do that often 
Uh, yes, you know, we tell people, you know, a lot of people come to the football games for football, but other people come to the football games for the bands. There are a load of people that come to the, to the games for band. And so the band students work just as hard. We have the same practice schedule as the football team. Uh, we start practicing back in the summer. Um, two weeks before school start, we practice every day after school. Uh, and the students are just as energized uh, to meet their friends in the other school. It's competitive, but it's a good friendly rivalry. Uh, myself and the opposing director, Mr. Seder, we went to school together. Uh, ah. We were both in college together. So it's wow. kind of like a, a meeting of the same kind yeah. of mind. So it's a lot of fun. Well, you guys did a phenomenal job tonight, and we will see you next week. Thank Th you very thank much you very for joining much. us. Appreciate it. Way. All right, we'll send it over to John Nelson. John? Thank you very much, Jackie. We're here at the big board for a reason, for a very cool moment. We've well, seen stuff in North Carolina, now we're gonna see stuff in Alabama. The gentleman who is directing the band over here on the right-hand side of the screen, that is my father-in-law, Dr. John, parenthesis Pete, close parenthesis Mosley, and he was brought out of retirement for a reason at Carroll High School in Matthews Stadium last week to direct the fight song, which he wrote for Carroll High and for the national anthem, which he does in about a minute and five. They've named the band room at Carroll High after my father-in-law. So it is now the Dr. John Pete Mosley Band Room at Carroll High School. And they brought him out of retirement last week, which I thought was very cool. Thank you very much, Ina G, mistress of the big board, for making sure all that stuff worked. So also going on, Region 1, Tift, Colquitt. They are now separated by a score with two minutes to go. It is now 41-33. And look at that. You call for it, and we kick it. Lovejoy and Tucker right now it is Lovejoy and Tucker. This one is a battle for Region 2, 6A. And right now, with the score being what it is, it could create a bit of an incident in Region 2. Had Lovejoy won tonight, it would have been them clinching the number one seed in Region 2. But with Tucker winning by 10 right now, this was an 8 o'clock kick at Adams Stadium in DeKalb County, Tucker could be inching their way up to the two seed, possibly as high as the one, because of the tiebreakers. Al Kobe right now looks like they're going to be the four. Tucker could be the anywhere from the one, the two, or the three, and this could go big one way or the other in determining who goes in which direction in Region 2 6A. That is our new version of kicking it, and I just thought that this was cool, and I'd like to thank everyone for letting me share. Back over to Mark. And I think, John, now you, since you've, you know, promoted your father-in-law a little bit, you get to move from the kiddie table to the big people's table at Thanksgiving this year. I think you did, too. All right, coming up, we've got some scores. We've got some highlights coming up this way. And Phil Proctor returns with another scary story from Georgia Traveler. All that and more coming your way as the GPB postgame show continues live from Halford Stadium. Stay with us. In a state with a dropout rate scary high. Students are vanishing. But a quiet movement is growing. A campaign to see every class graduate intact. The answer is out there. How will you stop the drop? Visit gpd.org slash stop the drop for more information. And I'll have what Phil's having. I'm finding some of the best food in the world. Wow, this is good. Right in my adopted hometown, Los Angeles. All this and more on the next I'll Have What Phil's Have. Los Angeles, right? Not so bad. Hey, hey, sir. Monday at 10 on GPB. Traveler and outdoors are back to a little something Water for everybody. Fantastic natural history, and it starts and ends on a Georgia beach. Catch all the fun, action, and beauty now on Thursday nights. Georgia Traveler at 8. And Georgia Outdoors at 8.30. Thursdays on GPB.
Welcome back to the GPB post-game show on Football Fridays in Georgia. Stevenson has just defeated Southwest DeKalb 55 to nothing, and we're going to check in now with Jackie Britton, who is alongside the band director from Southwest DeKalb, the best band in the land. Jackie? James Seda is joining me now with Southwest DeKalb, and they're filing out now, but, man, these bands have been going at it all night long. Very, very awesome performance Thank that we you. were able to witness behind the set. What have you guys been up to so far this year? Well, so far we've done a few community parades, the Heart of South DeKalb Parade that was right in our community, so uh, that was a big piece for us. We traveled to Nashville just a few weeks back, nice. and we participated in Tennessee State University's homecoming activities. Did a parade there. We won the first place parade band as well as a showcase of bands. So the kids got an opportunity not only to perform but visit a college campus. Nice. So that's always great enrichment. And uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, we'll be traveling to Orlando, Florida, and Tampa, Florida, participating in another Battle of Bands events, and then just giving the kids a four-day uh, break. All right. So what do you love the most about being at these high school football games and, and having your oh look at they're coming over here? What, what's the best part about it? The best, of course, I'm biased, I'm a music <laughs> person, but the best part about it is the, the exchange between the bands. And you saw it tonight, Stevenson High School Band, Southwest DeKalb High School Band. The kids and the band directors are all the best of friends, but when we get here, it becomes a little, a little competition of one-upsmanship. So we, we enjoy the band uh, back and forth and the atmosphere that we set. Well, I wish they weren't, I wish they didn't have to leave, but they've, they've joined us here. Do they have a little something? Uh, they going to do a little something or no? We don't want to. I don't know. Maybe. They're going to play a little something. Okay, well, I'll step to the side and we'll see what they've got. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, all right, let's, let's listen in here. What do you guys have for us? Not too loud. We don't want to wake the neighbors. <laughs> all right, Southwest DeKalb. They may not have won the football game, but they are competing hard for the band game. Let's go. Well done. Thank you very much, Mark. We're going to hang out over here as long as we can. I'll send it back over to you for now. All right. We thank you very much. <laughs> Phil Proctor is back. And Leo, <laughs> our <laughs> GPB sports mascot, is back. He's in his Halloween costume. He is Chewbarky today. And, uh, of course, we told you earlier he got the Wookiee of the Year award because oh, he is funny. just a cute little mascot that we have. I'm trying to tell you. And you look like you have him wrapped up so tight. Oh, I got tight. it. I, I mean, yeah, you're you're the man. I got him. And, you know, while he's dressed up in his costume, you went to a very scary place, or one of your traveler people did. Uh, definitely. Uh, Christine Van Blocklin went to check out uh, a cemetery. You know, a lot of times growing up, we all like to play in cemeteries, or some people did, but I wasn't really into that. Christine found out there's a lot of history at a cemetery called Oakland. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's listed with the Smithsonian. It has celebrities as permanent residents, and you can walk all over Atlanta's history here. Where are we? Oakland Cemetery. 1850 is when we began. There were about 2,600 citizens of Atlanta at that time, and so the city fathers thought, you know, we need to acquire some property way out in the country. So they came out here to what is now part of the Grant Park section of Atlanta to acquire six acres of land from a local farmer named A.W. Woody. Mr. Woody owned a farm here. His wife, Agnes, was already buried on the property. So the city just sort of designed on a grid the original six acres of, uh, of, the, of the cemetery around her. And today, Oakland Cemetery covers 48 acres with about 70,000 permanent residents. And it is beautiful, a majestic sculpture garden and architectural treasure dedicated to the lives of lost loved ones. 
I know what you're thinking. Cemeteries are spooky, not beautiful, right? Well, not really. During the Victorian era, as clothing and living styles were beautified, so were those creepy graveyards. When the rural garden Victorian movement for cemeteries came to this country from Europe, sort of taking the scary graveyard out of the equation and making this into more of a, what a cemetery means, a sleeping place. So you see a lot of pillows where people are asleep or the graves are marked by cradles, almost looking like a bed. Which brings us to our tour, searching for symbols. Those laid to rest here express who they are, even in the afterlife. Oakland Cemetery even gives you a symbols guide. Here is some cemetery symbolism 101. If you see a pile of rocks, that means it was a life built on a firm foundation. If you see a pile of cut up logs, that perhaps means it was a life cut too short. And throughout the cemetery, you will see these beautiful obelisks. Those date back to ancient Egyptian times, talking about a soul reaching towards heaven. Let's start with the basics. You will see plenty of religious and spiritual symbols here. All but two headstones here face east. They're facing the rising sun and many are following the Christian tradition. Of course, you will also see many Christian crosses, Celtic crosses, and stars of David. Angels are the spirit's guide pointing towards heaven. And a window or a gate in the middle of a headstone, well, that's a symbol for the spirit passing through to the afterlife. If you see a sheared column or one cut in half, that is the break between the life and the afterlife. More than 7,000 Civil War soldiers were laid to rest here, so of course you will see many Confederate flags and the Southern Cross of Honor. Seashells are a symbol of resurrection. Anchors signify hope, and those winding vines of ivy, well, that means friendship. And there's all sorts of architectural styles here, especially in the 55 magnificent mausoleums. This is the Richards family mausoleum, built in this wonderful 1880s Gothic revival architectural style. It is so amazing and it may look familiar. Does it look kind of like a chapel? Well, you are right. In fact, to this day, people still have their weddings here. Whoa, wait a minute, weddings in a cemetery? Oh yes. In fact, this tradition isn't new. For centuries, especially during that Victorian Victorian era, cemeteries have been used for special events like weddings and just plain old Sunday picnics. Why, you may ask? Well, for many cities, space was scarce and cemeteries were always well maintained, so they were often used as public parks. Next, let's check out the famous folk laid to rest here, like golf legend Bobby Jones, naturally with golf balls and a permanent spot for a hole in one. Then, the most visited gravesite at Oakland, Gone with the Wind author Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell was actually bo born in the Old Fourth Ward, which is just a few blocks um, uh, north of Oakland Cemetery. And as a child, she would ride Nellie, her pony, to Nelly. the Oakland Cemetery. <laughs> That's correct. Even Gone with the Wind character Dr. Mead is buried here. Well, sort of. The real doctor he was based on is Dr. James Nissen. Then look for Mayor Maynard Jackson. Hartsfield Jackson Airport is named after him, and he has a plot where he permanently overlooks the city he loved. That brings us to one of the most historic sections of Oakland Cemetery, the Confederate Memorial Grounds. In the center, you will see the Lion of Atlanta, based on the Lion of Lucerne, Switzerland, and he protects the unknown Confederate soldiers buried below. There are approximately 3,000 unknown soldiers buried here, in addition to the 3,900 we have in marked graves. And this sculpture was done by T.M. Brady. The Ladies Memorial Association had this um, commissioned after the Civil War. It's very symbolic. Look for the broken off spear in his back, the tear in his eye, and the Confederate flag cushioning his head. Nearby is another historic area, the African-American grounds. Look for Carrie Steele Logan, who established the first black orphanage in Atlanta. Her orphanage is symbolized for eternity as an elephant protecting her young. So after you've toured the about 70,000 burial sites here, you may start to get a bit of a sense of humor. Maybe it's just me, but I find this one hilarious. Good old Wilburn, Tennessee writer, a life so fully lived, heaven had to wait. He just had to add life after death, where is he? Gone fishing. Couldn't have put it better myself. All right, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was okay. Hey, what do you think of Leo's uh, costume? Hey, What's look, Chewbacca, that's my new hero, okay? It's I like know. I think every home should have at least one. Well, you know he's a great dame. <laughs>
Okay, Mark. Now, gonna, I, I knew this was going to happen. I, no, no, no. He's he's okay, that one you got to yeah. go ahead and just. You told that joke already it's there, great big guy. Though. It's gold, Jerry. Gold. It's hey, great. John, if that's his best Palladium. joke, man, you got to let it go, okay? That's his best joke. Tell a joke, tell a great joke once. Yeah. All right, a John. Great joke let's, once. Let's wrap up what's going on in the region of doom. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at what's going on in region 16A. But first, let's check in with region 2 and give you a quick update with what's going on with Tucker and Lovejoy. Remember, tonight, Tucker and Lovejoy. Lovejoy could clinch the region title in Region 26A as we kick it. And the update right now, Tucker was up 31-21. That hasn't changed at Adams Stadium under three minutes to go in regulation. And Tucker could be throwing everything back into the blender in Region 2 if this score holds on, beating the Wildcats right now 31-21. Tigers over Wildcats and the Wintersville Classic. Valdosta beat Lounge 17 to 7. So Valdosta goes back to back. Valdosta works their way into the battle for the three and the four seed. But it's all going to come next week with Camden and Colquitt figuring out who's going to be the one and the two, the three and the four in Region 1, the Region of Doom. So we're going to figure out what's going on around the state. If you haven't downloaded the GPB Sports app, do that because that way you can keep us up to date as we do with everything that goes on around the state of Georgia, everything from single A to 6A, all of the final scores as we get them in real time, you get to check out the final scores on the GPB Sports app. So download it and go to gpb.org slash sports. If you don't have it, if you have an Android phone, we are working on an Android version. Go to gpb.org slash sports. Go into the scores section. So it's one of two ways to be up to date as best you can when it comes to this time of year. Next week, we will have bracketology. We will fill in the brackets as best we know them, and we'll break out the slide rules and let you know what's going on around the state of Georgia as we get ready for the postseason. We will be at Lakewood Stadium for Mays and Stevenson and everything else as everything goes from 405 teams to 192. The postseason will start probably midnight Sunday because there'll be some Saturday games. And last time I checked, I think there are some folks who are hanging out around some pumpkins. And at least, you know, I have a little distance between me and Mark, so I don't have to hear the joke about the, the Great Dane for a third time here in the show, right? It's gold, Jerry, gold. Hey, before we go. Gold? It is not gold. Before, it was gold the first time. Before we go, we want to thank the superintendent of DeKalb County Schools, yeah. Dr. R. Stephen Most Green. Most certainly. Athletic director Horace Dunson and Jackie Simmons, who helped us out greatly to get this game underway. We appreciate it at GPB Sports and football fans all over the state of Georgia. Thank all of you folks from DeKalb County for helping making this possible. Absolutely. I can't believe that the regular season's almost done, and I can't believe it's Halloween, really. I mean, we're so far into this season and I actually hand carved my own pumpkin which I don't think I've done that since which one is yours? Wait, which one is yours? mine is the, the one that's broken is the football what, this one? That, yeah no, the one that's the got right. the broken laces it's all the way over it's a little deflated here can you uh -huh. hear me that what, See, she that's the even one. gets it's into a, that it's joke. a football where's the football see? jacket what, well, what well, is the laces now. hold on now y'all calm hey. down look there it, it, now it's perfect. It no. feels a yeah. little deflated, kind of like a New England Patriot <laughs> no, football. It, oh, what it actually looked like Better somebody with bad that. teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a football, see? So I, at first time since third grade, Come, probably, go that I've made right. my all own right, pumpkin. Nelly. These are all hand-carved by all the creative people at GPB. And I actually don't think any one of y'all carved a pumpkin. Am Nobody right? asked me. Yeah. Nobody okay. asked me. All and right. if I'm you carving a pumpkin, I'm making a pie carve a pumpkin because you don't want to see the results. Well, all I want to do is look in there and say, ooh. Oh, it's empty. I know. Seriously, I know we gave all our candy away. I'm going to have to go. See, that's the most now. important part of it all. Candy I can deal with. This stuff, uh, no chance. Well, it's okay, John. All right. JB couldn't either. No. Nope. <laughs> hey, watch it. <laughs> oh, 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 I can do it. Okay. Excuse She's me. ready to throw down. <laughs> I think it's time to send say us goodbye. home, Jerry. <laughs> it's, it's time to get Pass out of Mark's here before bedtime. anything happens. It's it is. All Hallows Eve. Thank you for joining us tonight on Football Fridays in Georgia. Here on our Halloween edition, we appreciate yes. you tuning in and watching. Next week, we're at Lakewood Stadium for big game, Mays versus Stevenson. So until then, have a great week. And, and so, so long, long everybody. everybody. And bye, too.
This is a GPB original.